Hannah contemplatively examined rows of vibrant boxes of head eye. She vaguely recalled reading somewhere that women undergoing stress find relief in a radical change of appearance, like cutting long hair into a trendy bob or updating their wardrobe. She wasn't keen on parting with her long locks, and a wardrobe makeover was out of the question due to budget constraints. However, she could afford a hair color change. According to the instructions on the box, it didn't seem too complicated mix the contents of two bottles, apply, wait half an hour, and voila, instead of her undefined russet curls, she could have a blondish mane. Hannah envisioned herself with snow white flowing hair and an evening gown, preferably beside a handsome man gazing at her with loving eyes. She smirked, though tears threatened. She had no man in her life, and now she was also unemployed. Well, at least she could transform into a stunning blonde. She grabbed two boxes of hair dye from the shelf. It wasn't entirely her decision to make a change. It was dictated by her superiors. Sighing, Hannah headed to the checkout. Perhaps it was a good idea to refresh her makeup collection. She might need a different foundation and a bold red lipstick. A blonde with red lips. Exquisite. But she had to be frugal. It was uncertain when she would find a new job. After paying, she left the store and slowly worked home. The weather was fantastic. The end of May, and summer was around the corner. She hoped to take a short vacation, just to swim, lounge on the beach, and not think about anything. To read silly detective novels where the killer was evident from the first pages, and the main character would inevitably marry the charming police major investigating the case. Hannah believed she deserved a break. She had worked in the store for almost five years, standing behind the counter from nine in the morning until nine at night, with only one day off per week. She dreamed of quickly paying off her debts and then enjoying some time off. But fate had different plans. She was fired this morning, and to add insult to injury, she was fined a considerable amount. Mrs. Miller, Hannah's boss, even threatened her with debt. Of course, working in a grocery store was not what Hannah had once dreamed of. She aspired to be a psychologist, helping others cope with their problems and emerge from depression. She felt that was her calling. She knew all too well about problems and depression. Growing up in a broken family, Hannah's father left them when she was five. The little girl barely remembered him. He was tall, or at least that's how she perceived him. It seemed like he was constantly humming to himself. He also read a lot. However, after he left, Hannah's mom discarded all his books, so she never learned about his literary preferences. Her mom never told Hannah why her father abandoned the family. Growing up a bit, the girl began to ask questions. However, her mom always redirected any conversation on that topic. He left because he was a scoundrel. End of story. And Hannah concluded that it must have been the case. Would a good person abandon a little daughter and a wife? Definitely not. Hannah's mom started drinking when the girl entered the seventh grade. Hannah didn't even know why it happened. At first, there were occasional gatherings with friends, good wine, snacks, just women and winding. After work, nothing more. Then her mom started drinking alone. Not frequently, just once a week, usually on Sundays. That's why Hannah simply hated Sundays. When her mom drank, she became angry, irritable, and shouted at her daughter. She would say that Hannah resembled her father and didn't love anyone but herself. The shouting would turn into drunken tears, followed by hugs and kisses. You're my only one. My joy, my little girl, her mom repeated, holding onto Hannah tightly. Hannah tried not to breathe in those moments. The smell of alcohol disgusted her. Her mom wasn't really like this. Her mom was good, kind, and loving. It was as if an evil spirit had taken control of her. When Hannah entered the 11th grade, her mother turned into an alcoholic. She used to work as a nurse in a hospital but she got fired for constant absenteeism and tardiness. Her mother scraped by with odd jobs, cleaning stairwells, putting up advertisements, and walking other people's dogs. Hannah also took on odd jobs, 
and got hired to wash dishes in a cafe near her home. She kept this fact hidden from her mother, fearing that she would demand money from her. She lied, claiming she was hanging out with friends or studying in the library. However, her mother didn't care anymore. Her sole interest was in drinking. Money was tight. Hannah's mother decided to rent out one room in their two-bedroom apartment. The idea didn't sit well with Hannah. She didn't want a stranger living next to her, but there was no other choice. Barely enough money for food and utilities. This is how Dexter came into their home. He was around 50, with tattoos on his fingers that hinted at a past spent in prison. Painfully thin, bald, with gold teeth and sly eyes. His appearance frightened Hannah, but her mother liked Dexter. They quickly found common ground. Besides, he worked in construction and earned decent money, making him a promising candidate in Hannah's mother's eyes. Now they drank together. In the evenings, they sat in the kitchen, listening to music on an old cassette player that Hannah's father had bought. Hannah did her homework in the cafe where she worked, and that's where she got her meals. She avoided being at home as much as possible. Her only dream was to get into university as soon as possible and move into the dormitory. As Hannah's school days were coming to an end, she eventually had to escape from home. Returning late as usual, she went to bed. She had already drifted off when the door creaked. Hannah sat up in bed, pulling the blanket up to her chin. In the doorway stood Dexter. He leaned against the door frame, smiling at the frightened girl. Even from a few meters away, she could sense the unpleasant smell of alcohol. Well, sweetheart, how was your day? Dexter hoarsely asked. I'm already asleep, Hannah said. I have to get up early tomorrow. You won't even talk to me. He took a step towards her and stumbled. Hannah realized he was terribly drunk. No, I really need to sleep. Hannah's voice trembled. Dexter unsteadily approached her bed and sat on the edge. You've grown into a beauty, just like your mother. He winked at her and placed his hand on Hannah's knee. We don't really talk, you and I, but almost like a family already. Hannah pulled her leg away and curled into a ball. She was genuinely scared. Cold shivers ran down her spine and her throat felt dry. I have to get up at six in the morning. She said, I need to sleep. You'll be late. He waved his hand. I've been watching you for a while. You're beautiful. You know, I can't decide what I like more. You or your mother. Listen, maybe. Hannah jumped up, almost tripping. She was trembling violently. Get out. She shouted immediately. Oh, what a prude. He jokingly raised his hands, as if surrendering. As if you've never. Get out. Hannah crossed her arms over her chest, trying to conceal her trembling. I'm asking you. Unexpectedly, Dexter abruptly rose from the bed and grabbed Hannah's arm. He pulled her towards him, exhaling in her face. I won't go. The girl screamed. She tried to push him away, but she couldn't. What's going on? Hannah turned around and saw her mother. She looked at them with an angry glare. An unexpected thought crossed Hannah's mind. She looks like an old woman, but she's not even 50. When did her mother age so much? Mom, he, he. Hannah pushed Dexter away with all her strength and ran to her mother, as if seeking protection. He came and she invited me herself. Dexter shook his head, worked into our bedroom and asked me to come. I thought maybe something needed fixing, like an outlet or something. Then she attacked me. Oh, you wretch. The mother turned to Hannah. I didn't know I raised such a daughter. Mom, it's not true. Hannah felt like she was in a nightmare. I, I was just sleeping. And then he, leave. The mother clenched her lips. Deep wrinkles appeared on her face. So my eyes don't see you here, Mom. Hannah wanted to reach out to her mother, but she took a step back. What are you doing? Mom, go away, you wretch, the mother shouted, and don't come back, Karis. Well, maybe, let's not, Dexter softly pleaded. The girl is not guilty, she's still young, 
Just made up in her head that I fell in love with her. Let her go. She'll think about her behavior. The mother said. Will you leave on your own? Or do I have to throw you out? Hannah's vision darkened. She realized she was about to lose consciousness. What to do? Where should she go? I'm waiting. The mother shouted. I don't need a daughter like you here. Hannah nodded slowly. I, I'll leave. But where will she go at night? Dexter looked at Hannah with faint sympathy. Who knows what might happen? Someone might bother her. It's not the first time for her. Perhaps the mother lifted her chin. Maybe already getting involved with other men. Hannah couldn't recall how she packed her backpack or how she stepped outside. She worked almost to the city center. One single thought pounded in her head. I am no longer needed by my mom. Mom needs Dexter. She chose him. And she kicked me out like a puppy. Fortunately, Hannah was lucky. She decided to send a message to the school social worker, Mrs. Hobbs, who knew about Hannah's mother's drinking and had offered her help before. Luckily, Mrs. Hobbs was awake and immediately called Hannah. Dear, come over. She said, I'll send you my address. You can stay with me and we'll figure things out. Hannah spent the next two months at Mrs. Hobbs's place. Mrs. Hobbs wanted to strip Hannah's mother of parental rights, but since the girl would turn 18 in two months, she gave up on that idea. Hannah enjoyed life with Mrs. Hobbs. There were many books, and Hannah immersed herself in psychology, sociology, and pedagogy. Once again, she realized she had chosen the right future profession. Her mother called a few times, demanding her return, but Hannah refused. She felt that she could no longer forgive the hurt inflicted on her. For her mother, Dexter was more valuable than her daughter, and it was dangerous to stay in a house with a criminal who had hinted at his intentions towards Hannah. The girl finished high school and applied to college. She was fortunate. Hannah passed the competition and became a student. She even called her mother to share the news, but the woman reacted indifferently. From her voice, Hannah guessed she was drunk again. That day, she clearly understood that she had no mother. There was a stranger, a woman who once gave her life, and apparently, that was the only gift. Because giving her daughter love and attention was beyond her capabilities. All that remained was to accept it and move on. At college, Hannah made friends, especially with Gemma, the daughter of wealthy parents. Energetic, fashion-obsessed, but endlessly good-natured. They were very different. Gemma bought fashion magazines, wasn't a stellar student, flirted not only with classmates, but also with male professors. She laughed a lot and loved attracting attention. Hannah was a quiet girl who preferred spending time with books rather than going on dates. In their first year, the two girls sat at the same desk and never parted ways. To Hannah's surprise, Gemma never copied her homework or asked her to write a paper. Hannah appreciated this in her new friend. Over time, Hannah came to realize that Gemma was not as simple-minded as she tried to appear. Gemma loved music, wrote good poetry, and played the guitar. But what Hannah liked most about her was her kindness. Gemma brought home abandoned animals, much to the chagrin of her parents. She fed Hannah when she had no money for lunch and shared her clothes. I bought this dress, wore it a couple of times, she would say, handing another bag to Hannah, and I got tired of it. Try it on. Maybe it'll suit you. If you don't like it, just toss it. There's also a blouse and jeans in there. Only in their second year did Hannah realize that Gemma was giving her new clothes with the tags removed. After all, the girls had different sizes. Gemma was taller and slightly fuller than Hannah. Gemma just didn't want to humiliate Hannah by buying her clothes. And for that, Hannah loved her even more. Help was never superfluous for her. Money was always tight. Studying took up most of her time, and Hannah didn't want to be distracted from her studies to earn money. She believed that after she got her diploma, all doors would open for her, and she could forget about the constant struggle to save on clothes and food forever. When Hannah entered her third year, she learned that her mother was seriously ill and on the verge of death. 
Instead of going to classes one morning, she rushed to the hospital. An elderly doctor, upon learning that she had come to visit her mother, sighed and spoke to Hannah. The days are numbered. Liva cirrhosis. Advanced. I sympathize with you, young lady. Hannah, barely holding back tears, entered the hospital room. She could barely recognize her mother thin arms and legs. A yellowish face. Her mother's swollen belly particularly frightened her. It looked as if she had swallowed a balloon. Mom, Hannah said softly. The woman turned to her daughter. Oh, so you finally came. She exhaled. Remembered about your mother when I decided to die. Ha, huh. think you'll get the apartment. Ha ha, not a chance. Mom, what are you saying? Hannah approached the bed and squatted down. I came to visit you. And I missed you, missed. Her mother turned away to the window. Hannah noticed that her nose seemed longer, maybe because her face had become so gaunt. Two years you've been gone. Abandoned your mother, called only on holidays, and you call yourself a daughter, and the apartment won't go to you. I left it to Dexter. Only he loved me. You and your father just used me. Hannah reached out and gently stroked her mother's shoulder. I'll come again, she whispered. I'll ask the doctor what you need to buy, and I'll come. Her mother didn't respond. Hannah left the hospital corridor, where the doctor was already waiting for her. I'm sorry. I overheard your conversation, he said, placing a hand on Hannah's shoulder. Don't be upset. It's hepatic encephalopathy. The liver can't eliminate toxins, and they poison the brain. She doesn't even realize what she's saying. Hannah nodded. Yes, I understand. She's been like this for a long time. She used to drink, and Hannah choked up, unable to contain her emotions. I'm so sorry. The doctor replied gently. Maybe I should bring something. Juice or oranges? Hannah asked, trying to change the subject. There's no need. We have everything. He lightly squeezed her shoulder. And don't torment yourself. I understand. After all, she's your mother. But the days are numbered. So, prepare yourself. The mother passed away three days later. And after the funeral, Hannah learned that she had indeed bequeathed the apartment to Dexter. She tried to talk to him. But Dexter didn't even let Hannah in. Just waved documents in front of her face. It's all legal. He declared. No disputing it. So go away. After her mother's death, Hannah stopped attending classes. She didn't want to leave the dorm, didn't want to wake up in the mornings. She didn't want anything at all. She constantly asked herself, for what? Why did such a thing happen to her? First, her father betrayed her, then her mother. Maybe she was somehow wrong. Hannah lied, claiming to be sick, but Gemma didn't buy it. A week later, Gemma came to the dorm to check on her friend. Reluctantly, Hannah opened the door to her room. What's your illness? Gemma inquired. Just a cold. Hannah gloomily replied. I have a high temperature. Sure, of course. Gemma nodded, entering the room. Caught a chill at the cemetery during the funeral. Hannah, you realize you're dealing with real depression, right? When was the last time you ate? Not long ago. Hannah lied. She had almost forgotten about food. It seemed she had some tea yesterday. Or was it the day before? Hannah, you look awful. Gemma placed a bag of groceries on the table. Here, there's ham, cheese, bread. And I ordered pizza for us. It'll be here soon. I'm not hungry, Hannah said. Indeed, she didn't feel like eating. Gemma unexpectedly approached her and hugged her so tightly that Hannah found it hard to breathe. Don't do that. I understand it's tough for you, Hannah. I asked my dad to look into your mother's apartment. Maybe something can be done. Gemma's father was a lawyer, one of the best in the city. If there was a chance to challenge the property rights, he would find it. Hannah nodded. Gemma, thank you, really, but you shouldn't have. It was worth it. Gemma shrugged. Dad himself said he would investigate. He was furious the moment he found out. I thought he'd go and punch Dexter right in his face. Hannah laughed. 
It seemed like the first time in weeks. Gemma's phone rang in her pocket. She took it out and glanced at the screen. Oh, the pizza's here. All right, let's eat now. And only then we'll figure out what to do next for you. Sound good. Hannah nodded. No one could resist Gemma's insistence. You're such a manipulator. Hannah sighed. I'm not a manipulator. I'm just lively, Gemma said. They chatted the entire evening. Hannah genuinely felt better. Whether it was Gemma's assurance that everything would be fine or just the fact that she had eaten, Hannah couldn't tell. Hannah decided to take an academic leave. She needed a break. The thought of studies was overwhelming. She believed that working for a year would allow her to save some money. Then, she could return to college to complete her degree. Don't do this, Gemma argued. Finish your studies. I'll help if needed. All our friends will help. Gemma, I just can't. Hannah shook her head. I can't focus on anything. Maybe I'm a bad person. But I thought I had a place to go back to. A home. Now I feel homeless. It seems I'll save up for a small apartment just to feel more secure and then we'll see. Well, as you wish, Gemma frowned. What about me without you, Gemma? Tears welled up in Hannah's eyes. I just can't. I feel like I'm standing on the edge of an abyss. I need solid ground beneath my feet. I need a home, any home. I don't understand. Gemma's eyes glistened too. I just don't understand why this is happening to you. You're good, smart, and yet everything turns out like this. Listen, maybe you can look for your father. Perhaps he'll decide to help you. I don't want to, said Hannah. He abandoned me. He didn't communicate with me for so many years. Didn't even pay child support. My mom tried to reach him, wrote letters, called, but he didn't react as if I didn't exist at all. And now I'll go to him and say, Hello, I'm your data. Buy me an apartment. Okay, he'll kick me out immediately. Hannah took an academic leave. With the little money she had saved, she managed to rent a room from an elderly, cultured lady. The room was tiny, but it was enough for Hannah. It was then that she got a job as a saleswoman in a store. She found a suitable vacancy that promised a decent salary. Things seemed to be going well. However, she couldn't return to college after a year. It took her three years to save up for the down payment on a mortgage and buy a studio apartment. But monthly payments were a constant struggle and studying was out of the question. Hannah earned much less than she had hoped for. She firmly decided to work in the store until she paid off the mortgage. After that, she could think about the next steps in her life. Yesterday, of her own accord, Hannah handed over the entire cash register to a robber. Ironically, business was booming that day. Hannah was pleased with the sales and was already anticipating a possible small bonus from the owner. She thought she could spend the money to treat herself to a little joy, perhaps by going to a cafe or buying a cute kettle for the kitchen. In the evening, a strange woman entered the store. She started asking questions about the products and Hannah answered without sensing anything amiss. Then, the woman approached her closely, inexplicably took her hand, and looked into her eyes. After that, Hannah didn't remember anything, just fragments. She opens the cash register, slowly counts the money, hands it over to the woman, and oddly thanks her. For what? She couldn't recall. Hannah woke up when the next customer arrived, a young man in glasses and a bright yellow shirt. Miss, miss, are you okay? Should I call an ambulance? Hannah shook her head. What? I just walked in, and you're standing here all alone, staring into space. The guy waved his hand in front of her eyes. You looked like you were hypnotized. I read about this. It happens with epilepsy. People seem to blank out and stand like that for hours. No, no. Everything's fine. I was just lost in thought. Probably tired. Hannah tried to smile. The guy bought a bottle of mineral water. With an automatic motion, Hannah opened the cash register and was stunned. It was empty. Only small change remained. She immediately called the store owner. Within half an hour, she arrived. Hannah, 
How do I understand this? She shouted. What do you mean you don't remember handing over the sales? And how much was there? I don't know, said Hannah, and you handed over the money yourself. The owner gave Hannah a skeptical look. Who's going to believe you, Hannah? Just confess. I won't scold you. Won't involve the police. Just give back the money and leave. Hannah shrugged. But I didn't take the money. And why should I believe you? The woman approached Hannah and pointed a finger at her ass. I didn't think you were a thief. I trusted you. And you betrayed that trust. You should have installed real cameras, not props. Hannah replied firmly. Her shyness was suddenly replaced by anger. How many times had she asked to install surveillance cameras in the store? But no, the owner preferred to cut corners. And now, here was the result. Sooner or later, it was bound to happen. Don't lecture me, said the store owner. You're fired, Hannah, and you'll have to pay me back for everything you stole. If there's no money within a month, I'll file a police report. Thus, Hannah found herself without a job and burdened with a debt that seemed insurmountable. The store owner claimed that Hannah owed her nearly 3,000. She had no idea where to get that kind of money. Now, Hannah worked home with two boxes of cheap paint in her bag, contemplating her next move. Should she escape from the city? Well, in movies, there are often such plot twists. The heroine completely changes her image, cuts her long hay in a gas station restroom, changes clothes, and steals a car. Hannah chuckled. A failure like her would hardly manage to steal even a bicycle. No, she would have to find the necessary amount somewhere. Otherwise, she wouldn't get off so easily. Hannah knew her employer's character well. She would unearth her from underground. Besides, she had connections with the local police. She had been dating some investigator for about three years, so Hannah had no chance. Upon returning home, Hannah headed for the shower. She wanted to wash away the experiences of the day. She vigorously scrubbed her skin with a washcloth and shampooed her hair three times. However, her mood didn't improve. After getting out of the shower, she read the instructions on the paint. Nothing complicated. Mix, apply, wait, and rinse. She applied the mixture to her hair, gathered it into a bun, and settled on the couch. She needed to find a side job. Anything cleaning floors, distributing flyers. She had to earn at least a part of the sum, plus money for the mortgage. It seemed she would have to work both day and night. There were job openings, but they promised to pay too little. This money definitely wouldn't be enough, but I have two kidneys. She muttered aloud, just need to find a buyer. Half an hour flew by unnoticed. Hannah called several potential employers. They were willing to hire her for pasting ads and delivering mail. Finally, it was time to wash off the paint. Hannah stood under the shower, putting her face under the warm water streams. Soon, she would see her new self. The hair seemed somewhat yellowish, but Hannah hoped they would look different when dry. Her hopes were in vain. The hair turned yellow, reminiscent of the color of freshly hatched chicks. She stared at herself in the mirror with horror. Tears streamed down her cheeks. Darn, she exclaimed, bright blonde. But why is nothing going right for me? The boxes showed girls with ashy blonde hair. But what went wrong? Moreover, individual strands were vividly red, giving Hannah an even more comical appearance. Wrapped in a towel, she returned to the room and collapsed on the couch. She felt like crying. There was always something wrong with her. Maybe she was cursed at birth, like in a fairy tale. An evil sorceress approached her cradle, waved a wand, and uttered dreadful words. Like, you never have luck in life, in anything. Every pastry you eat will accumulate on your hips. At 30, you'll prick your finger on a spindle and fall into eternal sleep. Although, most likely, a prince wouldn't come to wake her with a true love's kiss. Princes didn't need those like her. Hannah burst into tears. The phone rang. She wiped her tears with her palm and looked at the screen. Gemma. Hannah sniffled and answered the call. Hello, Gemma. Hi, Hannah. 
Her friend's voice sounded lively. I have a free day today. Maybe we can hang out after work. When will you be home, Gemma? I got fired, Hannah replied gloomily. Why? Gemma was surprised. Did you talk back to a customer? No. I stole money. Hannah sighed. I mean, not really. But that's what the store only thinks. Now I owe her a large sum. Well, Hannah, are you at home? At home. Where else would I be? Then I'm coming over. We'll figure something out. Hannah knew it was pointless to argue with Gemma. If she decided to come, she would. It was a relief that everything worked out well for her friend. Gemma had graduated from college, married a good guy much to everyone's surprise. Gemma didn't choose a handsome guy with wealthy parents, as many expected. Instead, she fell in love with a regular guy studying programming. Not tall, wearing glasses, and a bit shy. Together, they looked somewhat comical, but Hannah knew that Gemma genuinely loved her Malcolm. When she talked about him, little stars seemed to sparkle in her eyes. Hannah, yeah, he's not handsome. She smiled. I see that. Yes, he's not trendy, doesn't go to clubs, but you know, he's so intelligent, and he makes me laugh, and he never broke his word. Malcolm got a job at an international company and started earning well. Gemma found her calling too. She hadn't worked a day as a psychologist, but started writing children's books instead kind tales about princesses, princes, and dragons. Hannah had a complete collection of her works. Gemma's books sold excellently, and while Hannah sincerely rejoiced for her friend, she couldn't help feeling a bit envious at times. It seemed like they were characters from a fairy tale princess and pauper. An hour later, Gemma was already knocking on Hannah's door. Hannah opened it and said from the threshold, just no comments about my hairstyle. Okay, Gemma skeptically glanced at Hannah. Fine. Agreed. Just tell me, did you intend for this effect? Or did it happen by accident? Accident. Confessed Hannah. I thought I would be an ashy blonde. Ha ha. And you ended up looking like a chick. Gemma said. All right. I bought cheese, wine, and more fruits. Here, take the bag. Let's figure out how you'll move forward. But honestly, this color. Excuse me, Hannah. It's just a nightmare. I know, said Hannah. No worries. I'll recolor it. I hope you have a hat or scarf. Gemma chuckled. You know, to cover up this mishap, they settled in the room on the couch. Hannah declined the wine, but she liked the cheese. How much do you owe? Gemma asked. Almost 3,000, sighed Hannah. Imagine, it was like I was under hypnosis. I opened the cash register myself, took everything out. That woman seemed like my own mother. You wouldn't believe it. I just trusted no one in that moment like I trusted her. Understandable, said Gemma. I've read about such things. They hypnotize the cashier and take all the earnings. They can even snatch gold and phones. You fell into it, my friend. Horrible, Hannah said, and no security cameras. I can't prove anything now. Hannah, I'll say it again. Gemma lowered her voice. Just take the money from me. We don't need anything. Malcolm won't object. Pay me back whenever you can. No, Gemma. Thank you, but I don't want to owe you. Hannah sincerely smiled. Really, I'll try to earn it on my own somehow. Hannah sighed. Gemma, where can I find work? I found two job openings that seem willing to hire temporarily, but it's definitely not enough money. I'll end up in jail. And what then? I'll bring you care packages, Gemma promised, and I'll definitely stick a file in the loaf. You know, so you can soar through the bars and escape. Well, thanks, friend. Hannah shook her head, but I'd rather try to earn some money, at least a part. Forget about the mortgage. The main thing is to pay off the debt. The store owner will not let it go just like that. She has connections and a nasty temperament. Gemma pondered, then suddenly said, Hannah, you're incredibly lucky. I was talking to my dad about it yesterday. Actually, 
Right now, she snatched her phone from her pocket and dialed someone's number. Yes, Dad. Hi. Remember yesterday you were talking about Mr. Nunes having trouble with a caregiver again, right? Well, can you recommend Hannah? Yes, yes, my friend. She got fired. And, again, she won't take money from me. Tell them she's the best. Convince them. Like you do, you're a lawyer. Yeah, right now. Thanks. Waiting for the call. Bye. Gemma smiled at Hannah. Well, consider the job found for you. A good one. And Dad sends his regards. Gemma, can you explain what's happening? Hannah demanded. In short, listen. Have you heard of Mr. Muniz? No. Should I have? Hannah wondered. Gemma rolled her eyes. Kevin Muniz. He writes music and lyrics. Heard love and cold. Well, that sweet boy who sings. A bit dark. Well, I've heard something. Hannah pondered. It's where I'm always warm with you. Something like that, right? Yeah. Gemma nodded. And also I lost you. With you my soul is forever. He wrote many hits. Okay. And what does it have to do with me? Hannah asked. Well, the fact that my dad and Muniz have been friends for a very long time. He's a good man. I've seen him a few times. Still young. Around 40. Intelligent. Like you. Pleasant. So, he needs a caregiver. What's wrong with him? Hannah got scared. Is he sick? No, not him. His wife. Listen, there's quite a story there. Gemma's phone rang. Yes, Dad. Thank you. Thank you. You're amazing. Yes, greetings to you too. Bye. Tomorrow, Malcolm and I will come over. See you. Gemma looked at Hannah. Well, your job is secured. Let's go to Muniz right now. Hannah exclaimed. I'm in such a state. My hair. Put on a cap or a scarf. No time to waste. We need to go urgently. The previous caregiver was fired yesterday evening. She messed something up. And Muniz is helpless without her. Hurry up. Why are you still sitting? Okay. Okay. Hannah got up from the couch and opened the wardrobe. What should I wear? He's like a star, right? Jeans and a t-shirt, Gemma said, and a scarf. I'll drive you to his house. On the way, I'll tell you what the story is. Hannah quickly dressed, tied her hair into a bun, and wrapped it with a scarf. It turned out not bad, though the look was unusual. Excellent, Gemma praised. It suits you even. Well, let's go in the car. Gemma began her story. Kevin Muniz graduated from the conservatory. He was a promising pianist, performed abroad, composed music. When he turned 25, he fell in love with a girl who didn't reciprocate, and he composed his first song. You've definitely heard it. Gemma smiled. It's called First Snow. Yes, I've heard it. Hannah exclaimed. So he wrote that. It sounded everywhere. In short, he wrote the song, then showed it to some friend of his. The friend said it was a hit. Muniz didn't really want to sell it to anyone. But the friend persuaded him. And, you know what happened next. It topped the charts. And off it went. He wrote for almost all famous bands. By the way, he still writes. You definitely know almost all his songs. Just never bothered to find out who the author was like those simple melodies and the lyrics are simple but they catch you right listen once and you remember them forever like this one dance in the rain also his and your eyes are green hannah shook her head in amazement she knew all these songs some by heart could it be that she was about to meet their author unbelievable the composer's career rapidly soared he was a modest person didn't like to appear on television or give interviews. He was interested in creativity, not fame. Muniz composed one hit after another. All producers wanted to work with him. Naturally, he didn't need money. He bought a house, got a car, opened accounts in several banks, and then got married. 
He married Dariana Fuller. Gemma looked at Hannah. You definitely know her. She performed under the pseudonym Angel Ari. Yes, something. I vaguely remember. Hannah frowned. About 12 years ago or so. Her song was everywhere. Atomic feelings. Yes, yes, exactly. Gemma nodded. A one-hit wonder. Muniz wrote the song for her. And that's how they met. Well, in short. Love. They got married. Started living together. At that time, a well-known producer was promoting her. There were rumors of a romance between them. So, she ended up on the stage. She has no voice or ear. But she's beautiful. Hannah remembered Ariana. Yes, her appearance was quite memorable. A bright mass of red hair. A sculpted face. A magnificent figure accentuated by revealing outfits. But besides atomic feelings, she didn't have other hits. She appeared and disappeared. Like dozens of other One Day stars. Oh, there was also a video where she was on a motorcycle. Hannah recalled. Yeah. There was such a video. Gemma glanced at the navigator. All right, we'll be there soon. So, they lived together. A daughter was born, named Sophie. She's eight now. And then Ariana suddenly fell ill. It happened a year ago. She started complaining about headaches and weakness. Sometimes she wouldn't leave the room for days, lying in bed and watching TV. Muniz was deeply worried. She was examined in the best clinics, but everyone said the woman was perfectly healthy. They suspected depression, leukemia, even brain cancer, but they couldn't find anything. The young and beautiful Ariana just melted away, like a candle. And you know, they say it happened after the surgery. Gemma sighed. She had plastic surgery, decided to fix her nose. After that, her health began to deteriorate. I never change my face for anything. I'd rather be covered in wrinkles than risk like that. And then, one fine day, Ariana passed out and never got up again. In general, she just lies there. Gemma continued. She moves occasionally, opens her eyes, but nothing else happens. Doctors are clueless. They don't even properly treat some unknown disease. That's how they live. Muniz feels sorry for her. He loves her. He only allows one doctor whom he trusts. And caregivers constantly change. Why? Hannah tensed. Is it difficult to work with him? Ha. Huh. Gemma shrugged. It's not about that. Muniz is a kind person. You'll see. But there's always been something off. Nurses were initially taking care of her. But this doctor claimed they were always making mistakes. He said Ariana's condition could worsen because of them. The doctor does the procedures himself. His comes in every couple of days, gives injections, sets up some drips. You just need to take care of her. She eats if you feed her with a spoon. Reflexes are intact. She drinks. You need to attend to her hygiene. Plus, change the bed linens. Muniz does it himself often, but not always. So, I'll be feeding her and changing bed linens. Hannah asked. Yeah, and make sure everything is in order. If anything, call the doctor. He'll tell you what to do. They'll pay you well. It'll cover almost all of your debt. And if it falls short, Malcolm and I will chip in. Don't argue. All right. Hannah acquiesced. Just as long as they don't let me go after three days. By the way, how will I get there? Oh yes, I forgot to mention. Five days living with Muniz and two days off. Gemma smiled. You'll like it. He has a fantastic house. By the way, we're almost there. Engrossed in the story, Hannah hadn't noticed they had entered a cottage settlement. Neat houses, charming fences, and well-maintained paths. Clearly, prosperous people lived here. Such prosperity was something Hannah could only dream of. It's so beautiful here. Hannah sighed. Just like a vacation resort. Better. Gemma grinned. There's a forest nearby. The air is pure. You'll relax. The job isn't difficult. Muniz doesn't require any qualifications or experience. The main thing is to be a good person. How does your dad know him? Hannah inquired. Oh, 
They met at some fancy dinner. The entire city elite was there. My dad doesn't like those gatherings. He says there are too many people and there's no one to talk to. So, he picked the person with the most bored expression and struck up a conversation. That was Muniz. He's not a socializer by nature. Well, they became friends. Ariana was pregnant at that time. So, about eight or nine years ago, got it. Hannah noticed a picturesque house. A huge pine tree grew near the house. The house resembled a gingerbread one terracotta brick walls, a beige roof, a small balcony with carved railings. It took Hannah's breath away. What a beauty. I wonder who lives there. Muniz lives there. Gemma laughed. And you'll be living there too. She parked the car near the house. Together, they walked towards the gate. Gemma pressed the button, and a melodic ring echoed from afar. After a couple of minutes, a plump woman around 50, dressed in colorful dresses with a white apron draped over it, appeared on the doorstep. The woman wore a chef's hat on her head. Who are you? The woman asked. We're here to see Mr. Muniz. Gemma replied. You know about the job. All white. The woman smiled and walked to the gate. He mentioned you'd be coming. By the way, I'm Trisha. And who's going to work? I will, Hannah said timidly. Well, that's great. Trisha patted her on the shoulder. Hope he hires you. I'm tired of running around Ferrari. The kitchen is on the first floor and her room is on the second. I need to manage both here and there. Hannah listened to Trisha while looking around. It was so beautiful here. Small, recently planted apple trees grew near the house. There were pink flower beds near the porch and swings stood in the middle of the yard, probably for Sophie. Hannah had never been in such luxurious houses before. She sadly remembered her tiny studio. It's a shame that God didn't give her any special talents. How great it must be to do what you love, compose music that people enjoy, and get impressive fees for it. They entered the spacious, bright hall. Ladies, go ahead. Kevin is in his office. That door over there. Trisha gestured in the right direction. Knock and come in. He's waiting. Thank you. Gemma pulled Hannah along. What are you standing there for? Let's go. Hannah admired the bright walls adorned with landscapes Van Gogh, Kuinji, Dali. Clearly not originals, but Muniz seemed to appreciate the same artists as she did. This gave hope that they could find common ground. As an employee and employer, of course, they reached the office. Gemma raised her hand to knock. Wait, Hannah whispered. What should I say? Don't say anything. Just answer the questions. Gemma said, surprised. Your dad called. Consider yourself hired. Hannah got nervous. She would be communicating with a celebrity. What if she did something silly? Then she would be embarrassed in front of Gemma and her father. Gemma knocked. Come in. A voice came from behind the door. Gemma pushed the door and Hannah saw a small officer desk. Comfortable chairs. A computer nothing excessive. Next to the desk stood a synthesizer. The walls were adorned with record covers and a framed legendary photograph of the Liverpool Quartet. The Beatles, taken on Abbey Road, hung on the wall. Even without knowing the owner of this office, it was easy to guess that his life was connected with music. Hannah shifted her gaze to Kevin Muniz and felt herself blushing. He was exceptionally handsome. Perhaps, Hannah had never seen such beautiful men in her life. Chestnut hair, brown eyes, a straight nose, a firm jawline, with only a barely noticeable hint of grey at the temples. His appearance was noble, more like an aristocrat who spent all his free time reading and hunting. That's how a baron or duke could look. Hannah shook her head. A baron, of course, should have read few romance novels in high school. Gemma. Hello, how's your dad? Kevin inquired. A smile appeared on his face, making him even more attractive. Dad's fine. He invited you over. Mom's birthday is in a week. Will you come? I'll come. Gemma. Of course, I'll come. Haven't played chess in a while. Your father is one of the few worthy opponents. Hannah was amazed. 
Even his way of speaking was unusual. Somewhat bookish and slightly old-fashioned. Can you introduce me to your friend? Kevin asked. As far as I understand, she's looking for a job. Right, yes, this is Hannah. Gemma inched Hannah forward. We studied together at the University for Psychology. I didn't graduate, Hannah said for some reason. Dropped out in the third year. I'm afraid knowledge of psychology is not that relevant in our situation. Kevin sighed. I think you understand who I need. Someone who will responsibly perform fairly straightforward tasks. The main thing, no initiative. Do what the doctor says. And nothing more. Monitor Ariana's condition. That's it. Oh, I'm sorry, ladies. I didn't even offer you to sit. He pointed to leather chairs against the wall. Hannah and Gemma sat down obediently. Gemma crossed her legs, and Hannah sank to the edge, folding her palms on her knees. It's essential for me to trust the person who spends a lot of time with Ariana. Kevin continued thoughtfully. There were unpleasant incidents. First, we hired a nurse, and she administered some drug. Dr. Shepard said her blood pressure's Kai rocketed, barely managed to stabilize it. I wasn't at home, didn't see it, but I trust him like myself. Then there was another girl. She started spouting nonsense, claiming Ariana was healthy. Can you imagine? The person is practically paralyzed. Dr. Shepard also asked me to fire her. Then there was a third girl. She resigned yesterday without giving any reasons, just took off. And here you are, Gemma. I trust your father. He said Hannah is intelligent, responsible, a sensible girl. I hope everything works out for us. Right, Hannah. In response, Hannah nodded. Yes, I hope so too. That's good. Kevin smiled again, and Hannah admired his face. What a handsome man. Only the smile is sad. Not surprising. He's been through so much. Poor guy. And when can I start working? Hannah asked. I hope tomorrow. Kevin glanced quickly at his computer screen. Yes, I'll be home until noon. Take care of Ariana myself. Then I have a meeting in the city. I'd like you to be with us by then. Trisha will tell you everything about the documents. We'll sign the contract tomorrow. Good pay. And I'll provide you with a room. Trisha will show you everything. You'll figure it out. The kitchen is at your disposal, and you'll eat the same food as us, of course. Well, Hannah blurted out, just heavenly conditions. Well, I don't know, I don't know. Kevin darkened. I thought so too, but the caregivers keep leaving. Just some kind of trouble. Thank goodness for Dr. Shepard. Without him, I don't know what I would do. They talked a bit more about weekend pay and time off. Hannah was pleasantly surprised. After all, she had pulled a lucky ticket. For the first time in a long while, luck was on her side. The money Kevin promised would cover almost all of her debt. She could borrow the remaining amount from Gemma. She would quickly repay her if she worked for Kevin for at least a couple of months. Hannah had no fear. So what if the previous caregivers quit? They were not tough like her. She could handle anything. Two months and most of her problems would be solved. Then she could start looking for another job or stay here a bit longer, continue her education at the Institute, and start a new life. So, what do you think? Gemma nudged Hannah in the side with her elbow. Did you like Kevin? What are you talking about? Hannah snapped at her friend. No, I'm just surprised. Such conditions, and nobody wants to work. Oh, come on. Gemma smirked. I saw how you looked at him. Dad said Kevin has that effect on women. Unfortunately, no chances. He adores his Ariana. Monogamous. You know. It happens. Waits for her to come to her senses. Probably will be waiting forever. Such people don't cheat. That's great. But this information is absolutely not interesting to me. Replied Hannah. Okay. Let's go find Trisha. Trisha was busy in the kitchen. Hannah smelled the pleasant aroma of freshly baked cinnamon rolls, and her stomach suddenly growled. It seemed she hadn't eaten all day. Sit down, girls. 
I'll pour you some tea. Trisha smiled. I'll tell you everything about what and how. She seated them at the table, covered with a pristine white tablecloth, poured tea, and placed a plate of rolls. Hannah started eating with pleasure. You'll be working, right? Trisha looked at Hannah. Yes, I will, replied Hannah. Is it challenging? Nothing too difficult. Trisha shrugged. Just sit. Feed. Change. I don't understand why girls run away. Tell us about Dr. Shepard. Gemma inquired. Oh, doctor, doctor. Trisha's eyes lit up. Hannah understood that the woman genuinely sympathized with him. He's such a good man. So devoted to our Ori. They met when she decided to get a nose job. Then, these complications started. Of course, it's not the doctor's fault. He didn't perform the surgery. He just met her at the hospital. But he feels some kind of guilt, apparently. And he oversees her treatment. Comes to us several times a week. Incredible. Gemma shook her head. Just goes there. Because he suffers from guilt. Well, Kevin pays him. Of course, Trish replied. But still, he spends personal time. He says he won't back down until Ariana gets back on her feet. Kevin was wrong to refuse to sue the hospital. They're to blame. What? For what happened to Ariana? Hannah asked. And are you sure it's because of them? Absolutely. Absolutely. Trisha nodded. Who else? She was healthy. Engaged in sports. Ran he every morning. Such a clever girl. And then, bam, she got sick. By the way, right after the surgery. Well, coincidences like that don't happen. They definitely injected something wrong. Dr. Shepard scolds himself so much. Says if I had operated, this wouldn't have happened. Of course, how terrible. Sighed Hannah. All right, Gemma, you wait here and I'll show Hannah Oriana's room. Then we'll be back to you. Or do you want to come with us? Trisha got up from the chair and adjusted her apron. I'll wait. I don't like all this hospital atmosphere, Gemma said. Together with Trisha, Hannah went upstairs. Here is her room. Trisha approached the wooden door and smiled sadly. It became difficult to be in here when all this happened. Do you have any experience? No, Hannah admitted honestly. But I manage. Definitely. I hope so. If anything, you can always ask. I'll help however I can. Trisha opened the door and stepped back, letting Hannah enter. The girl saw a spacious room. The windows were covered, and the room was dimly lit. In the center stood a bed with a pristine high headboard. On the bed lay a young woman. Hannah was amazed. She truly looked like a fairy tale beauty, like Sleeping Beauty. Only her hair was cut short. The woman lay motionless, with closed eyes. Several plastic containers with medications were on the table near the bed. Hannah noticed a baby monitor. Probably, they used it to monitor Ariana's condition. This is our Ari. Trisha approached the bedside and adjusted the pillow. Ariana didn't move. Hannah felt uneasy. For a moment, it seemed to her that the woman was dead. Imagine, we use the same baby monitor we bought for Sophie. It's very sad. We wanted to install video surveillance, but the system malfunctioned twice. So for now, this is how it is. You won't have to do anything special. Just sit next to her, watch over her, and feed her. Well, you probably already heard everything. It's all simple. Hannah nodded in response. Yeah, everything is simple. It seems like there's nothing she won't be able to handle. An hour later, she and Gemma were already halfway to the city. Trisha is such a pleasant woman, Gemma remarked. Cozy place, and the rolls are delicious, better than in a cafe. Yeah, that's true. I feel sorry for Kevin, though. He has such sad eyes. Hannah hugged herself. Strange story with Ariana. Does that really happen? What could they have injected into her to make her like this? Well, I'm not a doctor. Gemma shrugged. Anything can happen. I wonder who that doctor is. Take a good look. Apparently, a kind man. If he's taking care of Ariana so much, maybe he's not married. Gemma, 
Hannah gave her friend a stern look. I don't need that. Well, you'll see whether you need it or not. Gemma laughed. If he's handsome, you'll notice him. Back home, Hannah realized she forgot about her yellowed hair, and the store was already closed. No more buying hair dye today. Well, she could go without it for another day. Wearing a scarf, she fell asleep quickly. She had too many impressions in one day. Strangely, Kevin appeared in Hannah's dream that night. He was playing the piano, and she sat beside him, watching his hands fluttering over the black and white keys. In the morning, Hannah quickly gathered the most necessary things and documents. She hoped she didn't forget anything. She was going to stay in Kevin's house for three consecutive days until Saturday, and then the weekend. Her mood was excellent. It could be considered a vacation. The air there was magnificent. Trisha mentioned a lake they could visit for an evening swim. Her own room. No need to spend money on food. Of course, she would still have to take care of Ariana. But what's so difficult? After all, she wouldn't have to set up IVs or perform other medical procedures. Hannah checked how much money was left on her card. Not much, but it should be enough for a taxi. She wrapped her head with a scarf to hide her hair and called a cab. However, a call from the store owner slightly spoiled Hannah's mood. She got into the taxi when her phone rang. Seeing the familiar number, Hannah felt a chill. What else could this woman come up with? Do you remember me? She asked, will the money be there? I hope they will. Hannah reassured her, I'll pay back soon. I'm waiting. The complaint is already written waiting for its time and tell me thank you that i haven't reported him yet i took pity on you fool thanks hannah replied coldly i'll repay everything to the last penny soon hannah was standing in front of kevin's house trisha opened the door just in time she smiled kevin is just about to head to his business meeting he asked you to supervise trisha winked and Hannah chuckled. Supervise. Don't worry, Hannah. Everything will be fine. Ask anything. I'll tell you everything. Answer all your questions. And Sophie is returning tonight. Kevin sent her to some camp for a break. I've missed our girl. You'll like her. They entered the house. Kevin was already in the corridor, adjusting the collar of his crisp white shirt. Hello, Hannah. He nodded. Glad you're on time. Kevin. The tie is crooked again. Trisha exclaimed, throwing her hands up. Haven't you learned it yet? Nope. Kevin smiled gently. Can you help if it's not too much trouble? Trisha started tying the tie. She looked like a caring mother preparing her son for his first date or graduation. Hannah felt a bit melancholic. If only she could tie his tie in the mornings, iron his shirts, wake up next to him. She daydreamed. She saw an attractive man and got carried away. Gemma was right. She should consider someone. Go on a date. Feel like a woman. Finally, Kevin bid farewell to Hannah and Trisha and left. Trisha showed Hannah her room. It was on the second floor small but cozy, with a sofa bed, a writing desk, and a convenient wardrobe. Here's the shower. Trisha explained. If you need a bathtub, I can move you to another room. Kevin won't mind. No, no, it's all good, Hannah said, barely containing her excitement. This room was more than her entire studio. Definitely, she should buy Gemma a bottle of champagne from her first paycheck. Pink champagne, her favorite. If not for Gemma, Hannah would have had to stand outside in the heat, handing out flyers or putting up posters on lampposts. Well, Make yourself at home. Will half an hour be enough for you? Trisha asked. Then we'll go to Ariana. I'll tell you what's what. Left alone, Hannah quickly unpacked, changed into comfortable pants and a t-shirt, and washed up. She even had time to lounge on the soft couch. If only she could have an apartment like this. She had a cheap bed that squeaked so much. Hannah felt embarrassed in front of her neighbors. As promised, Trisha came for her after 30 minutes. She led her to Ariana, showed where the medications were, 
handed her a schedule for administering them. She knows how to swallow. Just take the dropper, this one, and into her mouth. Just gently shake her shoulder to wake her up first, and she'll open her eyes. Trisha explained, I'll show you the first time, and then you'll do it yourself. Spray this into her nose every hour. When it's lunchtime, I'll call. We'll feed her. Nothing complicated, really. That's it. In a nutshell, Trisha, can I ask a question? Hannah said, of course, dear. Trisha patted her on the back. Ask whatever you need. Why do caregivers quit? Hannah asked. They pay well, and the job is straightforward. Trisha's expression darkened. Well, I don't really know. It seems like Dr. Shepard didn't like any of the caregivers, but Kevin trusts him completely. Something went wrong, and the doctor fears for Ari, feels guilty, wants to make amends. He'll stop by this afternoon. You'll meet him. Hannah felt uneasy. What if she doesn't impress Dr. Shepard, and she gets kicked out just like the previous caregivers? Don't worry. Trisha's mild. The key is to follow instructions. Don't argue with him. He knows what needs to be done. Okay, I'll go prepare lunch. Sophie is coming back. At first, Hannah stood near the bed, observing the unfortunate woman. Beautiful. No wonder Kevin fell in love with her once and for all. Such a woman is impossible to ignore. Hannah settled into a chair and took out her smartphone. Suddenly, she became curious about how Ariana looked before the tragedy. She quickly found the relevant photos. Yes, indeed, incredibly beautiful. Hannah remembered her from the music video. That's what they call model looks. Endless legs, a slender waist, and a full bust. Hannah felt a pang of sadness again. She would never be like that. Nature hadn't blessed her with voluptuous curves or a tall stature. Now her hair had turned into a yellow-brown mess, covered by a scarf. Fortunately, the hair problem could be fixed. Hannah decided to look for information about Ariana. The first few articles were about her illness. The star fell into a coma. Doctors suspected a stroke. Ariana Muniz won't return to the stage due to weight loss bills. Or this one. Heartbroken Kevin Muniz outside the hospital. Exclusive shots. Hannah opened the latest article. Paparazzi managed to photograph Kevin at the entrance to a private medical center. He stood bent over, head lowered, as if an enormous weight had pressed him down, one he couldn't shake off his shoulders. There was no one around. Hannah felt an overwhelming pity for him. Since then, he had lost so much weight. It turns out he was quite a big man. For some reason, Hannah felt like crying. Trisha distracted her from her thoughts. As promised, she came to help give Ariana medicine. Ariana did wake up as soon as Trisha touched her shoulder. She opened her eyes and cast a vacant look at Hannah. That's it. Just like that. Trisha sighed. She won't even recognize her own daughter. Administering the medicine to Ariana was easy. She obediently swallowed the syrup and fell back into a deep sleep. Head downstairs. We'll hear if she starts moving. Trisha winked. There's a baby monitor in the kitchen. Let's have some tea and get to know each other better. And Hannah decided to follow this advice. Yes, her job was simple, but it turned out to be terribly boring. Well, she just had to endure a couple of months. Maybe the previous caregivers quit precisely because of the boredom. Although for that kind of money, you could tolerate a bit of boredom. Trisha poured tea into charming red cups. Hannah inhaled the aroma with pleasure. Definitely an expensive leaf tea. Well, any questions? Trisha smiled. I can see. Dear, you're good. You'll settle in. Hopefully, you'll stay a bit longer. No questions. Hannah shrugged. It's all clear to me. Just feel sorry for Ariana. A young woman. And this happened. And Kevin loves her so much. What did he do to deserve this? Yeah, what? Trisha said thoughtfully. I've been thinking about it since Sariana came here. What do you mean? Hannah asked. Never mind me. Just ignore me. Trisha smiled insincerely. 
It's not worth discussing Kevin and his personal life. These are just my thoughts. Trisha. I'm genuinely interested. Hannah leaned towards Trisha. I won't tell anyone. I promise. Well. Okay. I'll tell you since you've started. Trisha took a cookie from the plate. I'm going crazy here. No one to talk to. When Sophie's around. I'm fine. We have fun in the kitchen. But now I'm alone. You know. I never liked this Oriana. Just don't tell Kevin. Although I think he probably guesses. Why didn't you like her? Hannah asked. Just listen first. I'll tell you. Trisha smirked cunningly. And you'll draw your own conclusions. Trisha had been working for Kevin for a long time. Since he bought the house 11 years ago. He was looking for a woman to cook for him. And he found Trisha. Who lived in a village not far from the cottage settlement. I don't know how he found me. Trisha sighed. I've always known how to cook and loved it. Everyone knew that since childhood. I always chose the most challenging recipes. They invited me to every wedding to set up the table. Well, I guess someone must have told him. At that time, Trisha was going through a difficult period in her life. Her husband left her. He worked in the city, met someone else, fell in love. A typical story. Trisha was left all alone. She suffered, cried at night, and scolded herself for not holding on. Now, who needed her at 43? Men wanted young ones. She thought her life was over, didn't even have children. Her husband had some problems on the male side. They went to the doctor in the city. He said she was fine, but he wasn't. They decided it wasn't meant to be. Perhaps that's what God wanted. They thought about adopting a child, but kept postponing it. Trisha gladly accepted Kevin's offer. When she saw the modern kitchen equipped with everything she needed, she was thrilled. She had only seen something like this on TV shows and in magazines before. Kevin genuinely loved Trisha. Sometimes it seemed to her that he saw her not just as a housekeeper, but as a relative. Perhaps a beloved aunt. Yeah, and I felt sorry for him. Trisha smiled at her memories. He was somewhat ill suited for life. A creative person. A musician. If you didn't remind him to eat, he might forget altogether. But he was a good, very kind man. The money was good. Everyone in village envied to Trisha. They envied so much in the village that they set my house on fire. But the police didn't find anything. They wrote, electrical wiring caught fire. After the fire, Kevin suggested that I live in his house. She hesitated. It felt awkward, but he insisted. Trisha, it's not a burden to me. It will take so much time to repair and restore everything. He said, live with me permanently. The house is huge and I'm alone. Why not? Trisha agreed. Now she lived with Kevin and was completely satisfied with her life. She perceived Kevin as her son and he treated her with the same warmth. Oh, and the gifts he gives for birthdays, for Christmas. Trisha smiled. Very cool. Once he sent me to the city, to a spa salon. I felt like a queen then. And he just laughed. Said I deserved it. Hannah smiled. Trisha had indeed been lucky in life. And Kevin was fortunate to have her. Then Ariana appeared in Kevin's life. Trisha was struck by her beauty. She had never seen anyone like her before. Only on TV or in music videos. It was impossible to look away from Ariana. When she entered the room, Everyone's eyes were on her. Kevin fell madly in love with Ariana. He wrote one song after another, and all of them were dedicated to his beloved. Ariana seemed to reciprocate his feelings, but I saw that she wasn't what she pretended to be. Trisha said, with him, she's like a sweetheart. Her eyes are like a deer's. She looked at me with malice. She was polite to me in front of him, but when he wasn't around, she'd shout at me not satisfied with anything. The porridge is wrong. Not enough or too much sugar in the tea. Or the tablecloth is crooked. You'd think she's a queen. But Trisha decided not to talk to Kevin about it. Let the grown man figure it out for himself. Besides, she hoped that Kevin would understand who he got involved with. 
but the man was in love. Trisha understood that it was heading towards a wedding. And she was right. Kevin proposed to Ariana. She agreed, but with the condition of signing a prenuptial agreement. She would have rights to all the songs written during their union. And Kevin agreed, but he writes less now. Trisha sighed. No hits for several years. He writes more for theaters. They pay less. But why does he need it? He has earned enough for a lifetime. And there will still be something left for Sophie's children. Trisha didn't like Ariana. She even laughed at herself. She behaved like a mother-in-law who doesn't like any daughter-in-law. But with Ariana, there was always something that repelled Trisha, making her feel uncomfortable around her. She's like a porcelain figurine, Trisha said thoughtfully. Seemingly beautiful, but touch it cold. But Kevin liked her. He carried her on his hands, not lying. He really carried her, Hannah. Once it was raining, she had some expensive shoes. He carried her from the car to the doorstep. Can you imagine? Sophie was born. Kevin was overjoyed, flying on the wings of happiness. He adored his daughter because Sophie was his little copy, same eyes, same hair, the same love for music. Ariana, on the other hand, was indifferent to the birth of the baby, as if she had fulfilled a duty and could now focus on herself. Her life was meaningless. Trisha frowned, shopping, then working on her figure. She blamed Sophie, as if the child was responsible for her weight gain during pregnancy. I accidentally overheard once when Sophie was three. She ran to show her drawing to her mom. Ariana glanced at it, didn't like something. Sophie got upset, and Ariana said to her, Don't be offended. Mom lost her figure because of you. Can't lose weight. Sophie cried for two hours, and I had to comfort her. And how did Kevin react to this? Hannah asked. Oh, he didn't. Even if he noticed something and tried to talk to Ariana, it didn't work out. She'd make big eyes, shed a tear, and he would immediately yield. Kevin can't stand women's tears. The moment he sees them, he's ready to do anything to prevent his beloved from crying. So, it always turned out that he was to blame for everything in Ariana's eyes. She was always slippery, like a toad. Trisha added, Hannah chuckled. Well, sometimes things happen. Everyone lives their own way. That's true. Trisha raised her eyebrows. She thought I was just a simple village woman. But I read detective stories, watch movies. I understand a thing or two. I think she wanted a divorce. When Kevin wasn't home, she'd make phone calls, asking about money, probably dividing the joint property. But in front of Kevin, not a word. Sweet, beloved, the only one. Got it, sighed Hannah. Well, things happen that way. But she didn't have time to get divorced, Trisha concluded. Look what happened to her. She decided to fix her nose. Only it's not noticeable that she did something. When Dr. Shepard removed the bandages, everything remained the same. And Kevin, too, feels sorry for her. He lost weight, weakened, looks pale somehow, nightmare, in a word. Good thing Dr. Shepard helps us, didn't abandon us. And by the way, here he is. Trisha looked out the window. Hannah followed the direction of her guys and saw a silver car approaching the house. Well, expensive car. Do plastic surgeons earn that much? Hannah exclaimed, yes, plastic surgery is lucrative. Regular doctors, who save lives, get paid peanuts. Trisha shrugged. But for noses, lips, and buttocks, they pay a fortune. Okay, go check on Ariana, see how she is, and then you'll meet Dr. Shepard. Hannah went upstairs. Ariana was dozing. Her eyes were closed with thin, almost transparent eyelids. Thin arms lay on top of the blanket. Despite Trisha's story, Hannah still felt sorry for this woman. Maybe she'll get better. Modern medicine can work wonders. Perhaps she'll be back on her feet, and Kevin will be happy again. Hannah remembered his sad eyes, his smile, the wrinkle on the right side of his lips. She shook her head. Could it be that Gemma is right, 
and Hannah fell in love with him at first sight. It will pass. I shouldn't behave like this. After all, she's not a teenage girl. The door opened. A portly man in a stern suit entered the room. His eyebrows were furrowed, and his face seemed tense and worried. Are you the new caregiver? He asked without a greeting. Yes, I am. My name is Hannah. The girl introduced herself. I heard about you from Dr. Shepard. I'm thrilled. He muttered irritably. Tell me about yourself. Me. Hannah was taken aback. I studied psychology, didn't finish, and then worked as a saleswoman in a store. In a store. Dr. Shepard sneered. Well, yes, in a grocery store. Hannah stammered. Do you have medical education? He asked sternly. No. But Kevin said it's not necessary. Not necessary. You know, for some reason, people with medical education he have made one mistake after another. Something they know too much, more than the doctor. That's why I insisted Kevin hire an ordinary person. I hope we'll work well together. The main thing is, no self-initiative. Hannah was surprised. She had heard this phrase several times already. What had the previous caregivers managed to mess up? No self-initiative, Hannah promised. Sorry, but what's going on with Ariana? Why is everything like this? Dr. Shepard looked at the girl disdainfully. If I try to explain, you won't understand. You have your responsibilities. Just focus on them, please. Do you think you'll understand her diagnosis better than I do and prescribe treatment? Why was he reacting like this to an innocent question? Well, they say doctors can be quite arrogant. One of the consequences of burnout. Now you can go. Dr. Shepard nodded toward the door. I'll examine Ariana and give her an injection. You're not needed here for now. Okay. Hannah nodded. What an unpleasant guy. Why is Trisha so impressed with him? She thought. Hannah went back to the kitchen. He's tough. She commented. No self-initiative. Ignore it. Trisha smiled. She had already put the pie in the oven and was now cutting vegetables for a salad. A doctor should be like that. But Ariana is alive because of him. Maybe only thanks to him. No one really knows what's wrong with her. Maybe so. Hannah sat on a chair still unpleasant. Don't think about it. Trisha approached Hannah and parted her head. And I wanted to ask, why are you wearing that rag on your head? Is it a fashion there? No. Hannah remembered her hair and felt upset. I dyed it in successfully. Show me, demanded Trisha. Maybe you're mistaken. I'm not mistaken, sighed Hannah. Now, just don't laugh, please. I wanted to become a blonde, but it turned out to be. Well, what it turned out to be. Hannah untied the scarf and let her hair down. The sight of them made her want to cry again. Oh my, my dear, Trisha exclaimed. You look like a little chick. Yeah, like a little chick. Hannah shook her head, letting her hair fall around her shoulders and flashed a playful smile. The whole evening, it's the Hannah the Clown show on the arena. Tricks, jokes, funny acts. Trisha laughed. Don't worry, you'll fix it. She added, Trisha. Unexpectedly, an eight-year-old girl burst into the kitchen. She hugged Trisha around the waist and giggled. Trisha, hi, Sophie. Trisha kissed the girl on the head. You're here. And I didn't even notice. Got carried away with Hannah. With Hannah. The girl finally noticed Hannah. Hello. Wow. Your hair. Are you? Are you a fairy? Did you come to break the spell on my mom? Hannah was amazed. Indeed. Sophie, a carbon copy of her father, had the same brown eyes. I'm Sophie. The girl approached Hannah and extended her hand. Nice to meet you. Can I have hair like yours? So beautiful. I had a doll with the same hair, but then she got lost somewhere and we never found her. Sophie sighed. I think my hair isn't that beautiful. Hannah laughed. It's like someone drew it with markers. It's beautiful. Sophie insisted. I like it. Hello again, girls. Kevin entered the kitchen. Hannah wanted to sink into the ground. 
She hadn't managed to put on the scarf, so she sat there with her loose yellow locks. What a nightmare. The most handsome man in the world, who she seemed to have fallen for a bit, sees her like this, as if without your hair, he would have proposed to you right away. A sarcastic inner voice muttered. You're just a beauty, especially compared to Trisha. Hannah, very unusual indeed. Kevin politely smiled, although his eyes betrayed surprise. I know many girls like these shades nowadays. It suits you. At first, Hannah thought he was mocking her. But no, he was probably trying to give a compliment. I'll go to mom, Sophie declared. Wait, dear, Dr. Shepard is with your mom. You can't go in now. Trisha held the girl's shoulder, as if trying to keep her. When will he leave? Why doesn't he let anyone in to see mom? I don't like it when he's here, sweetie. Dr. Shepard knows what he's doing. Kevin sighed and sat down. Let's have dinner, Hannah. I hope you don't mind having dinner with us. Hannah was surprised. She was sure they would just give her a portion and send her to her room. Not at all. If I won't be a bother, she said timidly. You won't, Sophie declared. Tell me how to make hair like yours. It's like the sun got tangled in them. Hannah chuckled. Thanks. Now, when someone tells me they don't like my hair, I'll just say, the sun got tangled in it. You wouldn't understand. She noticed Kevin looking at her attentively, with a peculiar, contemplative gaze, as if peering into something deep within. Seeing her soul, it made her uneasy. She apologized. Excuse me, Kevin. I didn't have time to tidy up before joining you. It all happened so quickly. He smiled. I understand. I really like it. Hannah looked at him skeptically, but he seemed genuinely serious. They had dinner, and the threshold turned out to be delicious. Sophie ate two pieces and then leaned back in her chair, folding her hands on her stomach. They didn't feed us like this at camp. Trisha, why can't everyone cook like you? Because Trisha has a talent, Kevin said, placing his hand on Trisha's. Such a gift is rare. He added, suddenly, Hannah felt light-hearted, as if these people she had known for such a short time were her family, as if she were not just a caregiver, but a member of this family. And after dinner, they would go to the living room. Kevin would play the piano, and they would listen to his music, talk about this and that, laugh and have tea. Hannah felt tears welling up in her eyes. No, one cannot dream of such things. She has no family, and never had. Even her own mother turned away from her. Her father abandoned her. She would just sit next to this warmth, warm up a bit, and then move on. And they would forget about her forever. Dr. Shepard entered the kitchen. Hello, Kevin. He shook Kevin's hand. Well, everything is fine. Stable condition, no changes. In our case, we can consider it positive news. Good. Kevin closed his eyes for a moment. Probably, it's indeed good. This week we can take her to our clinic. We'll do an MRI of the brain and see what's going on there. Dr. Shepard continued. I hope there will be some dynamics. Can I go to mom? Sophie asked. Go. Dear. Kevin looked tenderly at his daughter. I'll come up soon too. Sophie smiled at Hannah and rushed upstairs. Dr. Shepard took a seat on the vacated chair. Kevin, you don't look good, he noticed with concern. You're losing weight. Yeah, I know. Kevin shrugged, probably from stress, some weakness. It's hard to work. I can't concentrate on anything. Kevin, we need to check everything again. Dr. Shepard's gaze became attentive and somewhat sharp. Hannah felt a slight unease. Go for tests again with us. Maybe your hemoglobin is low. Although I suppose it's all from chronic stress. Yeah, probably. Kevin nervously played with a teaspoon in his hands. But what can I do? This will continue until Lariana recovers. I can't relax. I keep thinking about her. Let me give you another shot. Dr. Shepard suggested. Maybe you'll get some decent sleep. And when you have time, come to us. We'll check everything again. I don't like your condition. Why a shot? 
Trisha suddenly intervened. After the last shot, Kevin slept almost a whole day. Is that good? Good. Dr. Shepard snapped. In sleep, the mind and body recover. Trisha, I told you I don't like it when someone interferes in my affairs. I do have a medical degree, and I haven't done anything to lose Kevin's trust. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Kevin rubbed his forehead with his hand. I agree. But a shot, or I really can't sleep well lately. Let's go, Dr. Shepard. But first, I'll check on Ariana. Trisha, Hannah. Goodbye. They left the kitchen. Trisha shot a glance toward the retreating Dr. Shepard. His injections are suspicious. What is he injecting him with? Kevin sleeps like a log afterward. And you can't get anything out of him. Well, the doctor knows better what to do. Hannah tried to reassure Trisha. They've been studying for so many years. He knows. The smartest one. Trisha started washing dishes. Making loud clattering with plates and cups. Do you need help? Hannah offered. No. Dear. The woman replied. After you feed Ariana one last time, go to bed. She sleeps peacefully at night. Dr. Shepard prescribed a sedative for her. After feeding Ariana, Hannah went to her room. An anxious feeling lingered with her. There was something about Dr. Shepard. Something unpleasant and off-putting. Maybe it was indeed his arrogance. But on the other hand, what mattered most were his professional qualities. Before going to sleep, Hannah looked at herself in the mirror for a long time. Well, the hair color did turn out interesting. Though, as if the sun got tangled in it, the next day passed much like the previous one. Hannah carried out her duties. Trisha showed her how to change bed linen quickly and how to wash Ariana with a special foam. Hannah skillfully handled all the tasks. She had some free time and Trisha suggested she take a stroll in the garden. Lilacs were beginning to bloom, and their delicate scent filled the air. Hannah inhaled deeply, enjoying every breath. It was great that she had the opportunity to live in such a house, even if only for a short while. Hello, Hannah. Came a voice from somewhere in the garden. From the bushes appeared Sophie's content face. There's an ant hill, and the ants are so big. Show me. Hannah laughed. I haven't seen ant hills in a while. Come on. Come on, Sophie called. There are lots of ants, and they're carrying something. For almost half an hour, they observed the ants. Then Sophie suggested looking at her favorite garden figurine, a gnome in a red hat. I make up stories about him, Sophie said, stroking the gnome's ceramic hand. Be it that he's a kind wizard who will heal my mom, and she'll be happy again. Stroll around. Talk. I feel for you, Hannah said. Maybe it was a lot of fun with your mom. But don't worry. I believe she'll get better. It wasn't very fun with mom. Not very fun. Sophie pondered. She said it's not interesting with little ones. That when I grow up, she'll spend more time with me. For now, dad will communicate with me while I'm little. Hannah looked surprised at the girl. Did Ariana really say such things to her child? Or is Sophie just making it up? Let's play something. I have half an hour. Sophie tried to distract Hannah. What do you want to play? Sophie lit up. Let's build a house. Out of what? Hannah laughed. Do you have building blocks? No. Sophie whispered. Out of little stones and sticks. Like ants build. Hannah set out to bring Sophie's project to life. The girl brought her stones and twigs. Hannah tried to make some kind of hut from them. Finally, she succeeded. Although the roof of the house had to be made of grass, seeing the finished house, Sophie laughed and clapped her hands. Great. Now we just need to decide who will live there. Let your magical gnome live here. Ha. Huh. At night, he comes to life, shrinks, and goes home. From work. Exactly. Sophie unexpectedly hugged Hannah around the waist. You came up with something cool. Okay, I'll go. I need to check on how your mom is doing, Hannah said, patting the girl on the head. We'll come up with something else tomorrow. Okay, Hannah turned towards the house and suddenly noticed that the window on the ground floor was open. Kevin stood by the window, 
watching them thoughtfully with a faint smile. She smiled back at him and waved. We built a house here. She added for some reason. For the gnome, Kevin nodded. Beautiful house. Sophie, you are great. And you, Hannah, too. You have the talent of an architect in you. Hannah shrugged. Anything is possible. This time she had dinner with Trisha. Kevin and Sophie decided to eat in Oriana's room. Well done. Hannah praised Trisha. So far, you're my favorite among all the previous caregivers. Ha! Huh. Do you say that to everyone? Trisha laughed. But thanks. And you're helping me a lot too. She went to bed in a great mood. Tomorrow, another day in Kevin's house. And then she would go back home. Perhaps she'd finally dye her hair normal color. She would need to buy some gift for Sophie. It's a pity for her. After all, she lacks maternal attention. Of course, she won't replace her mom. But Hannah really wanted to bring some joy to the girl. Through her sleep, Hannah heard music. She listened. Someone was playing a gentle and melancholic melody on the piano. The music seemed to try to soar upward, but immediately fell into a minor key. Hannah sat up in bed and closed her eyes. This melody, it was like it was about her about all her unrealized hopes, losses, and the pain she has been carrying in her heart for a long time. Hannah desperately wanted to go downstairs and see Kevin playing. He probably becomes even more beautiful when engaged in his favorite activity. But, of course, she didn't do that. What would he think? That she's a sleepwalker wandering around the house at night. Listening to the enchanting melody, Hannah fell asleep. The next three weeks flew by unnoticed. Hannah learned to take care of Ariana. Trisha praised her, saying that she did everything as if she had been taking care of sick people all her life. And Hannah finally dyed her hair. Now it wasn't yellow anymore. She chose a reddish shade that seemed to make her face a bit brighter. At least that's what she thought. Hannah spent a lot of time with Sophie. She felt that she was starting to get attached to the girl, and that made her a little sad. After all, someday she would have to leave, and Sophie would feel bad about it. The girl had already lost her mom almost completely, and her dad was in deep depression. So, sooner or later, Hannah would betray the girl. However, she consoled herself with the thought that it wasn't necessary to completely stop communicating. If Kevin allowed, she could visit Sophie at least occasionally. Trisha taught Hannah how to cook. Now her pies were no worse than Trisha's own. Kevin didn't even notice the difference. Only two factors upset the girl. The first one was Dr. Shepard's behavior. He acted as if Hannah were a country girl who had somehow ended up in a wealthy house. Hannah tried not to pay attention to it and continued to do her job. The second disheartening factor for Hannah was Kevin. More precisely, that she had fallen in love with him. For the first time in her life, she felt such feelings for a man. Of course, she had crushes and even a couple of short-lived romances before, but those emotions couldn't be compared to what she was feeling now. She listened to his songs, trying to understand what he was thinking when he wrote them. She secretly admired him when he played the piano or read books in the living room. She imagined him hugging her, saying tender words, and them falling asleep together in one bed. Hannah knew that this would never happen, but it was so pleasant to dream, especially before bedtime, when she listened to Kevin playing another melancholic melody. Kevin behaved reservedly toward Hannah. Sometimes he talked to her about how her day went, about Sophie, about Ariana, nothing more. But sometimes she caught his strange, long, contemplative gaze, as if Kevin saw something in her that others didn't, and that gaze made her feel like she was on fire. One day, Kevin invited her to join them for a picnic by the lake on Saturday. Sophie has grown attached to you. She'll be thrilled, he said. She's already dreaming of swimming races with you. I'm not much of a swimmer, Hannah laughed, but I would like to join if you don't mind. After all, I'm still a stranger, Hannah blushed, why did she say that? If he's inviting her, it means he wants her there. And it's not like he's asking her out. I don't mind. I'll be glad if you spend time with us. Kevin smiled. On Friday evening, 
Hannah didn't go home but stayed at Kevin's house. In the morning, they all went to the lake. Trisha joined them. At the lake, Sophie immediately dragged Hannah into the water. The girl didn't swim very well. Sophie, who had been going to the pool for a long time, so there was no fur competition. But Sophie didn't mind, I'll teach you, she promised. Coming out of the water, you'll swim like a fish. Sophie, you're all blue. Trisha exclaimed, waving her hands. You'll catch a cold. Let's go into the sun to warm up. Sorry, Hannah said, disappointed. I got carried away and didn't watch her to make sure she didn't get too cold. No big deal. Trisha waved her hand. Sophie, take a towel and wrap yourself up and put on a hat. You'll get sunburned. Trisha led Sophie out of the shade. They settled about 10 meters away from Kevin and Hannah. Hannah began to dry her hair with a towel and once again caught Kevin's strange, contemplative gaze. She hesitantly smiled. Sorry, I should have made sure she didn't get too cold. Kevin shook his head. Nothing to worry about. It's all Trisha. She worries about her. Sophie hardly ever catches a cold. Hannah caught herself staring at his lips. She coughed and awkwardly lowered her gaze. But it seems you caught one. He stood up and touched her hand, making Hannah feel a sudden electric shock. Have some tea. Trisha even takes hot tea with her in such heat. Can you imagine? Thanks. I'm fine. Hannah wrapped herself in a towel. Silence fell. The girl felt awkward. It seemed like they should talk about something. But what? Thank you, Hannah. Kevin said unexpectedly. But I'm genuinely grateful to you. For what? She wondered. I'm not doing anything special. I'm just doing my job. I'm not talking about Ariana. His gaze became strange again. Contemplative and sad. I'm talking about Sophie. She's like a different person with you. I haven't seen her like this in a long time. Maybe I don't have the strength to give her everything she needs. I'm glad you came into our lives. Hannah felt herself blushing. You have a wonderful daughter, she remarked. She's easy to talk to and pleasant to be around. She didn't befriend other caregivers like this. Kevin stretched out on the sand, and Hannah glanced at his broad chest covered with dark hair. Oh, to lie next to him and embrace. It's all because of the hair, Hannah said. Apparently, they impressed her on the first day. Well, I like them too. Kevin raised his head, looking at Hannah, and smiled. Honestly, I thought you wouldn't cope. I only agreed to take you in for Jack's sake. Hannah nodded. Jack is Gemma's father. Kevin continued, I just learned a bit about you. Or rather, about your biography. I pictured you completely differently. You found out about me. Hannah flared up. So, he knows about her mother, about Dexter, about the alleged theft of money. I wonder what he really thinks of her. Hannah, forgive me, but I can't just let a stranger into the house like this. Kevin said apologetically. Gemma talked to her father about you. He knows your biography and thinks highly of you. Maybe you don't know, but he believes Gemma is lucky to have a friend like you. Hannah lowered her head. Gemma's parents had always treated Hannah well, but she still felt like a pauper who had somehow befriended a princess. Hannah, I'm sorry if I upset you. Kevin sat down and shook his head. I didn't mean that. Yes, I know about your mother and what led you to seek this job. I trusted Jack, and I don't regret it at all. Hannah turned away, tears welling up in her eyes. She had daydreamed. Imagine something beyond reality and he simply performed an act of charity. Seeing in her the daughter of an alcoholic who probably stole money from the store where she worked. And now, he's trying to tell her that. Thanks, Hannah, for entertaining Sophie. Hannah, his voice sounded very close. She felt his hand on her shoulder. The girl flinched and turned around. His face was next to hers. She was amazed again at how handsome he was. Hannah, forgive me. I said something foolish. Don't be offended. She silently looked at him, and he at her. Suddenly, he touched her hair with his fingers. Indeed, as Sophie said, 
It's like the sun got tangled. He softly said. Hannah swallowed. Maybe all of this was just a dream. Sorry, Hannah. He abruptly moved away from her and lay back on the sand. I'm doing something. Something wrong. Hannah. Let's go swimming again. Sophie appeared out of nowhere. I've warmed up. First, have some tea. Then you can go into the water. Let Hannah rest. She's been running around with you all day. Trisha mumbled, following them. Look at her. She's gotten so thin, running around with you all day. Let's go. Sophie grabbed Hannah by the shoulders. Come on. Come on. Come on. The rest of the day, Hannah felt uneasy. Why was Kevin behaving so strangely? His guys and the way he touched her hair. No, employers shouldn't behave like this. Moreover, he has a wife. Even if she's currently sick, he loves her. That much she knew for sure. Gemma said he was a one-woman man, and Oriana was his only love. Could he be like any other man? Decided to have a little fun. Why not? But it's strange that he chose her. Hannah always considered herself, if not plain, then quite ordinary. Ariana, on the other hand, is a true beauty. Hannah decided to push this incident out of her mind, and Kevin didn't behave similarly afterward. Although after the beach incident, Hannah began to have dreams in which he touched her much more intimately. On Monday morning, as usual, Hannah changed Ariana's bed. Trisha had bought new sheets, which were larger than the previous ones. Hannah diligently tucked the sheets under the mattress. Suddenly, she felt an object. She carefully grabbed it with her fingertips and pulled out a notebook from under the mattress. Just an ordinary, cheap notebook. Hannah turned the discovery in her hands with surprise. What could it be? She opened the notebook and flipped through it. A piece of paper fell to the floor. Hannah picked it up, stuffed it into her pocket, and tried to make sense of the strange notes. Unfamiliar words, numbers, a date, an unclear word, and a number. Apparently, the dates were from the previous year. What are you doing? And displeased voice of Dr. Shepard echoed. Hannah startled. The doctor had discreetly entered the room and now stood with crossed arms, looking disapprovingly at Hannah. I found it under the mattress. She confessed. There was no point in lying, and she didn't know how long he had been watching her. Someone probably forgot it here. Give it here. He approached her and reached for the notebook insistently. It's known of your business. Hannah handed the notebook to Dr. Shepard. And don't snoop around here. He frowned. What are you looking for? And what if I tell Kevin about this? I'm not snooping around. Hannah stammered. I just found it by accident. Just like that doesn't happen. Get out of here. Fine. I won't tell Kevin anything. But if I find out you're sniffing around, you'll regret it. Dr. Shepard turned to Ariana, signaling to Hannah that the conversation was over. The girl rushed out of the room. Her heart was pounding wildly. What will happen now? What if he complains to Kevin? And then she'll be fired. Yes, the debt problems are already solved. But she doesn't want to leave, as there will be no Sophie, Trisha, or Kevin in her life. Her anxiety turned out to be in vain. When Kevin returned home, he behaved with her as usual. Apparently, Dr. Shepard decided not to tell him anything. Hannah calmed down a bit, but still, Dr. Shepard behaved strangely. Why did he react like that to the notebook? Who knows what could have been in it? Maybe Sophie was playing around and hid it. Perhaps it was Trisha's notebook. That day she couldn't fall asleep. She tossed and turned, imagining Kevin calling her into his office, scolding her for searching Oriana's room, and then, then, Hannah would pack her things and go home, forever, through half-sleep. She heard the music again. She glanced at the clock. It was almost two in the morning. Kevin probably couldn't sleep. Tossing and turning, Hannah threw a robe over her pajamas and left her room. She just wanted to see him, see how he played. Quietly, she left the room, descended the stairs, and tiptoed to the living room. The door was slightly ajar. Holding her breath, Hannah froze near the doorway.
Kevin was playing a sad, already familiar melody. His face was illuminated only by the moonlight. She thought about approaching him, hugging him, trying to dispel his perpetual sadness. But how? Who was she? Just a caregiver taking care of his beloved wife. He finished playing and paused. Hannah was afraid that he would stand up, see her, and took a step back. Suddenly, the world turned upside down. The girl screamed and fell on her back. Her vision darkened from the pain. Damn, it seemed she had caught her foot on the carpet. Hannah, he was already working towards her. She sat up, rubbing her lower back. There was nothing to do. If she tried to escape, it would only get worse. Cheeks reddened with shame, and what would she tell him? How to explain her nightly works around the house? Kevin extended his hand, not hurt, no, just a bit. She stood up and looked at him apologetically. I thought of getting some water. Went to the kitchen, heard you playing, and wanted to listen. Do you like it? He asked, yes, very much. Hannah honestly admitted, it's really beautiful. Maybe I disturb you. Sophie is sound asleep. Trisha too, and you probably aren't used to this. He sighed, just can't sleep at night. I feel drowsy during the day, but can't sleep at night. Kevin unexpectedly smiled. How about some tea? Since both of us can't sleep, Hannah shyly lowered her gaze. Of course, she wanted to be alone with him, but at the same time, she felt terribly awkward. Let's go. He put his hand on her shoulder. Just sit for a bit. Hannah nodded. Okay. And sorry for distracting you. They went to the kitchen. Without Trisha, it seemed empty and unnaturally vast. Kevin turned on the kettle and took out the cups. You know, Hannah, I wanted to talk to you. He sat across from her, and his gaze sent shivers down her skin. Well, now he would definitely fire her. Yes, she exhaled. Don't worry, he smiled. I sometimes feel like I'm scaring you with something. I wanted to ask, you spend a lot of time with Ariana. Maybe you notice any changes in her condition, Hannah pondered. Perhaps not. She doesn't see any changes. Sometimes, Ariana seems more active, as if trying to sit on her own, reaching out for Hannah to pull a shirt over her. But nothing more. No, I'm afraid it's all the same as it was. Kevin's face darkened, and a deep wrinkle appeared on his forehead. Understood. You know, I really hope Dr. Shepard is a heaven-sent doctor. He helps us all he can. I do pay him a little extra. He refuses money, at least the money he deserves. Sometimes I feel that. It's all pointless. I'm really sorry, Hannah said quietly. If there's anything I could do, you're already doing it. Kevin unexpectedly placed his hand on hers, probably even more than you realize. What? Hannah wondered. I, I'm just a caregiver. There was a loud click. The water in the kettle boiled. Hannah flinched. Kevin continued to look at her as if forgetting that they wanted to have tea. Hannah, with you, life seems to have returned to our home. You can't imagine how worried I was about Sophie. She withdrew after what happened to Ariana. And now I hear her laughter again. And Trisha, she treats you like a daughter. He smiled. She's already looking for a guy for you in her village. But, in her opinion, no one is worthy of you. Hannah looked at him in surprise. She brought life back to their home. Imagine that. And I feel terribly ashamed in front of you. Kevin continued. I said too much back then. Well when we were at the lake. I understand perfectly that it hurts you to recall the past. No, you don't understand. Hannah withdrew her hand from his, even though she didn't want to. She suddenly realized that she was angry with him. How could he understand her? A wealthy man who has everything one can imagine. He doesn't know what it's like to be betrayed by everyone he knew. What it's like to be completely alone. I understand. He tilted his head and now looked at her slightly from below. Hannah, almost no one knows this, but I grew up in an orphanage. What? It seemed to her that she misheard. Yes, yes, only no one knows about it. And I hope you won't tell anyone. 
Journalists would love this information. He closed his eyes, as if remembering something. Yes, when I was 11, my parents died in a car accident. My aunt, my mom's sister, took me in. She wasn't exactly thrilled and often punished me. Yeah, I don't hold a grudge. She was only 25. She had to arrange her life. And here I am, a difficult teenager, a difficult teenager. Hannah asked. It was impossible to imagine Kevin with a beer bottle and a cigarette in his mouth. Well, yes, he laughed. I could stay away from home for days, skip school, got involved with a bad crowd. My aunt couldn't handle it. Well, then, the shelter wasn't the best. I used to get into fights a lot, just to prove that I was worth something. You know, people from such places more often end up behind bars. But, apparently, I was lucky. I loved music, and I met Mrs. Turner. She taught music at our place. It was a tough class. Imagine a whole bunch of students just waiting for the class to end. And she, an intelligent woman of the old school. I pretended I didn't need all of that. But deep down, I felt that music was my thing. My life, if that doesn't sound too pretentious. And did you pursue music with her? Hannah asked. Yes, I did. He tapped his fingers on the table. She taught me everything she could, recognized my talent, helped me get into the conservatory, and I eventually became what I am. So, Hannah, I ask you not to consider me a benefactor doing you a favor. Suddenly, he turned pale sharply and leaned back in his chair. Sweat appeared on his skin. Hannah jumped up from her chair and ran to him. Kevin, what's happening to you? She touched him and got scared. He was as cold as a corpse. Sorry, something, something's not right with me. He wiped his forehead with his hand. I don't know what it is. Should I call an ambulance? The girl asked, or maybe get some water. Yes, yes, water, if you could. Kevin asked. A few minutes later, he felt better. Hannah stood near him, afraid he would collapse. Some kind of strange sieges, he complained. They used to be rare. Now almost every day, I've lost consciousness several times. What do the doctor say? Hannah asked. Kevin's condition worried her. I was checked at Dr. Shepard's clinic. Everything is normal. The man shrugged. He says it's nervous. He gives me shots. They seem to help a bit. At least I get some sleep. I see. Hannah reached out to him. Maybe I should escort you to your room in case you fall again. I can manage. He struggled to get up. He swayed like a drunk. The man took a few steps and then turned to Hannah. I'm afraid your help wouldn't hurt me after all. She put her arm around his waist and they slowly worked to his room. Hannah was struck by his thinness. He used to be a athletic man, judging by the photos. Did grief really undermine him so much? At the door to his room, he stopped. Thank you, Hannah. Don't mention it. She replied, looking at him. Are you really feeling better? Should I call a doctor? He didn't answer. Instead, he unexpectedly took her hand and brought it to his lips. Hannah felt a hot wave, standing there, forgetting how to breathe. Thank you, he whispered. And forgive me, Hannah. I'm probably losing my mind. Good night. As the door closed behind him, Hannah stood still for a few more minutes. Yes, she was definitely going crazy, inventing things that weren't real. She needed to see a doctor herself. He would prescribe her pills to calm her nerves. Hannah shook her head and went to her room. On the way, she decided to check on Ariana. There was a troubling feeling in her soul. She wanted to make sure her ward was okay. She entered Oriana's room and looked around. Everything was as usual. A nightlight glowed above the headboard, and the curtain by the window swayed slightly. Hannah approached the bed. The woman lay motionless, and only her chest rose and fell rhythmically under the blanket. Hannah was about to go back to her room when she suddenly felt something wrong. There was something that shouldn't be there. She closed her eyes. Perhaps fatigue was taking its toll. She needed to lie down and get some sleep. She looked at Ariana again. 
Something gleamed on the pillow near her head, and Hannah took a closer look. There was an earring in Noriana's ear, a regular earring with a white stone. Hannah circled the bed. There was no earring in the second ear, and she hadn't worn any during the day. No one put jewelry on Ariana. They were all kept in a box near the dressing table. Kevin hadn't changed anything. Even Ariana's perfumes and cosmetics remained intact, as if waiting for their owner. But there it was an earring. Someone had put it on Ariana. Hannah rubbed her nose. Perhaps she was overthinking things. Maybe Sophie played with them. I'll ask her about it tomorrow. This thought reassured her. But still, something felt off. Fortunately, when she returned to her room, Hannah quickly fell asleep. And during the night, she dreamt of Kevin dancing with her and then kissing her hand gentle, barely touching her skin. And she melted from that touch. In the morning, while getting dressed, Hannah found a piece of paper in her pocket. She carefully pulled it out the rolled up sheet. The same one that fell out of the notebook, discovered under the mattress. Hannah swallowed. What if Dr. Shepard discovers the loss? He will surely tell everything to Kevin, and she'll get fired. Kevin will never look at her the way he did last night. Yes, it might mean nothing to him, but a dose to her. Read it or just throw it away. Maybe it's best to burn this damn piece of paper. Hannah pondered. Well, she could get rid of this evidence later. Curiosity prevailed after all. She unfolded the sheet and saw a few lines. My dear, I miss you and wait for everything to be as we dream. Don't forget about the pills. Do everything carefully and cautiously. Together we will prevail. With love. US. US. Probably a note from Dr. Shepard. But who is it addressed to? Maybe this notebook belongs to him. And he writes down medication dosages for his patients. And this note is for his beloved. But how did it end up under Ariana's mattress? And this earring? Hannah sank onto the bed. What if? No. This can't be. No. 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 Definitely not. Ariana and Dr. Shepard. They met shortly before her tragedy. How could they have become lovers so quickly? And why would Ariana need it? She has a wonderful, well-off husband. She has a daughter. She has everything for happiness. Hannah mechanically put the letter back into her pocket, stood up, and walked to the mirror hanging on the wall. Well, she looked terrible. Pale skin, shining eyes, uneven red patches on her cheeks. She pressed her palms to her face, trying to calm down. Maybe she was just winding herself up. Perhaps she had fallen in love with Kevin and was trying to find some way into his arms. Ariana cheated on him. So what? She's seriously ill now. And he doesn't abandon her. He cares for her and loves her. Why would he need someone like Hannah with her problems and perpetual bad luck? Once again, luck wasn't on her side. Of all the men in the world, she chose the one with whom she would never be together. She had breakfast with Trisha. Kevin took Sophie to the city for her classes. You see Moff. Trisha noticed. What happened? I didn't sleep well. Hannah lied, stirring her tea. Maybe some atmospheric disturbances. You are lying, Trisha said. I can tell by your face that you are lying. Tell me, what happened? Hannah decided to surrender. Well, Trisha, I was just thinking. Do you think Kariana cheated on Kevin? Oriana? Kevin? Where did you get that idea? Trisha squinted. Do you know something? No. Hannah hesitated. Read some things on the internet. Various stories. Got curious. Maybe I'm poking my nose where it doesn't belong. Trisha pondered. Then unexpectedly spoke up. I think she had someone. Not long before all this happened. Really? exclaimed Hannah. So, you suspect something? Trisha suddenly lowered her voice. She started disappearing. Used to sit in her room at home. Sophie tried to talk to her, but she'd say, leave me alone, mom's busy. It was painful to watch. And then suddenly, she started leaving when Kevin wasn't around. For the whole day, comes back happy, eyes sparkling.
I immediately knew she fell in love with someone. It's obvious, Hannah felt awkward. She started smoothing the tablecloth to hide her agitation. What? Trisha smirked. It's evident on you too. Do you think I don't notice how you look at Kevin? Ah, too bad for you, girl. I regret he's such an honest man. What? Hannah was surprised. What do you mean? Well, if he weren't so honest, maybe something could have happened between you two. Trisha sighed. But he can't. As long as his wife is sick, he won't date anyone else. Trisha, I didn't. I didn't even think about that. Hannah mumbled, blushing. Oh, that's your business. If something happens, I'd be happy for you. Trisha shrugged. Ariana, she's beautiful. Sure, but just empty. Maybe she cheated on Kevin. God probably punished her with illness. With whom? Where? I don't know. Maybe there wasn't even anyone. Just don't tell Kevin about it. Of course, I won't say anything. Hannah nodded. She wanted to ask about the notebook, but she didn't know where to start. Suddenly, Hannah heard the sound of an approaching car. Maybe the classes were cancelled, and Kevin and Sophie returned. She looked out the window. No, it wasn't Kevin. It was Dr. Shepard. That's strange. Trisha wondered. He wasn't supposed to come today, although his schedule is flexible. Maybe he decided to visit, probably. You know, he seems like a good person, but he visits quite often. Writing a dissertation on Oriana, maybe Dr. Shepard got out of the car and headed towards the house. I'll go meet him. Trisha sighed. What kind of person is he? He should have warned at least, rather than just showing up like at his own home. Hannah stayed in the kitchen. She heard Dr. Shepard talking to Trisha about something, but couldn't make out the words. After a couple of minutes, Trisha came into the kitchen. Dr. Shepard is calling you. He seems upset. Her face looked troubled. Did you do something wrong? No, I don't think so. Hannah whispered. I'll go. She stepped into the hall. Dr. Shepard stood there, arms crossed. She had seen this poster before, on the day she found the notebook under the mattress. Let's go, Hannah. Dr. Shepard commanded. We need to talk. He turned and worked into the garden. Hannah glanced at Trisha, who merely shrugged. Dr. Shepard launched into an attack immediately, without any warning. Hannah, give back what you stole, or you'll regret it. He said, I didn't take anything. She replied, what could I have stolen? You know very well what. Dr. Shepard said, his lips trembling with indignation, as if Hannah had taken something extremely valuable. Was he talking about that note? I don't understand. Hannah crossed her arms over her chest, as if shielding herself from his onslaught. It would be better if you told me what you want from me. He squinted. You think you can command me? Who do you think you are? Do you understand who you're talking to? I understand. Hannah tried to infuse maximum calmness into her voice, but it still quivered with excitement. But I don't understand what you want from me. A letter, he said. I need a letter. If you give it back, maybe Kevin will just fire you, and that will be the end of it. And if not, Hannah asked, if not, You'll have enormous problems, Dr. Shepard promised. Problems you never dreamed of. I don't know what letter you're talking about, and I don't know why I should be fired. Hannah lifted her chin, fool. Dr. Shepard cursed. Since you've decided on this, so be it. But don't think you'll get away with it. He turned and worked toward his car. Hannah watched him thoughtfully. It seems like she discovered something very important and dangerous. Could it really be him and Oriana? But she's sick. Doctors confirmed it with tests. Tests. Done at the clinic where Dr. Shepard works. Hannah suddenly realized. Her mouth went dry. The girl trembled. Either from excitement or adrenaline. It seemed she understood everything. Now she needed to figure out how to prove it and explain it to Kevin. Injections. What is Dr. Shepard injecting into him? Yesterday he looked so pale, as if he were about to die. Well, what did he say? Hannah didn't notice Trisha approaching. 
What did you do wrong? Nothing. Hannah replied pensively, to the surprise of both Hannah and Trisha. Dr. Shepard returned a few hours later with Kevin. It turned out that Ariana needed to be taken to the clinic for additional tests for a couple of days. An ambulance with the logo of the clinic where Dr. Shepard worked arrived. What happened? Hannah asked him. Is Ariana worse? No. He shook his head sadly. We need to check something there. Dr. Shepard said so. He knows better. In the evening, Hannah tried to recall at least one word from the notebook. Some meaningless combinations of letters. She entered them into the search engine, hoping to eventually hit the target. Finally, luck was on her side. The drug used during surgical procedures, Mu relaxant. She read. So, it's a medicine that relaxes a person's muscles, literally paralyzing them. Oh, my God. Hannah couldn't wait to share this information. But with whom? Definitely not with Kevin. Maybe tell Trisha everything. Or should she go straight to the police? What had she gotten herself into? Hannah unfolded the letter that had been in her pocket. It was addressed to Ariana, written by Dr. Shepard. Unfortunately, she didn't have samples of his handwriting. But she heard that there were experts who could prove that letters were written by a specific person. She had almost everything she needed. Now, she just needed to figure out how to handle this information. The door to her room opened quietly. Hannah thought it was Trisha. Sometimes, she would come in the evenings to chat. But it wasn't Trisha. Don't move. A male voice commanded. Hannah froze. An unfamiliar man in a mask approached her. Only his eyes were visible. But what was more terrifying was the gun pointed at Hannah. Not a sound, or I shoot. The man said indifferently. Hannah silently stared at the barrel of the gun. He approached her. Hannah was surprised that he moved almost silently. Or perhaps she couldn't hear anything except his voice and the sound of her own wildly beating heart. Hands. He ordered. What? Hannah exhaled. Stretch out your hands. He repeated. Hannah understood that arguing was pointless. She obediently extended her hands to him. The man put the gun behind his belt grabbed her wrists, and quickly wound a rope around them. Then he jerked her to her feet and led her to the window. Sit, he said quietly. The girl sat on the floor. The man wound the rope around the radiator. Hannah tried to move her wrists, but she couldn't. The man pulled out the gun again and pointed it at Hannah's head. If you scream, someone will die. For example, your beloved Sophie. Believe me, I'll hear if you make even a sound. Hannah closed her eyes. Is this really the end? Quiet, he said. Do you understand me? Nord if you understand. Hannah nodded. The man holstered the gun and patted her on the head. Good girl. He silently glided to the door and disappeared. Hannah listened. No sound. What was happening? She tried to free herself, but couldn't. The rope held her hands tightly preventing any movement. She pulled. The rope cut into her wrists, and Hannah realized that she had scraped off the skin. Sophie, is she held hostage by these people? And who are they? Robbers? Or the person sent by Dr. Shepard? She pulled again, and still nothing. Such pain. So intense that bright stars flashed before her eyes. Tears streamed down Hannah's cheeks. What to do? She was utterly helpless. Suddenly, she caught a whiff, barely noticeable. At first, she thought it was her imagination playing tricks on her. She froze. It was real. The smell of burning plastic. They set the house on fire. The girl frantically moved, trying to break free. It seemed with every struggle, the rope tightened even more. She looked around. There must be something that could help her escape. It seemed there were scissors on the table. But the table was too far. Or maybe she could make it. Stretching out on the floor, she attempted to reach the table's leg with her foot. Her hands were in unbearable pain. But she didn't care. After all, the smell was growing stronger. Hannah reached for the table. Only a few centimeters away. Closer. Even closer. She didn't know what she would do next. But she couldn't just wait and see. Come on. Just a bit more. She lay on the floor, 
trying to stretch her spine. If only the scissors were at the edge. If only she could reach. Finally, the tip of her sock reached the table's leg. She struck with all her might. The table moved, but nothing happened. The scissors were still on the tabletop. Again, again. The smell of smoke intensified, making it difficult for Hannah to breathe. She coughed, no longer afraid to attract attention because there was nothing to lose. Another strike. Another. A glass fell to the floor, shattering into small pieces. Perhaps this would be enough. With her foot, Hannah pushed the largest shard towards herself. Lifting it with her fingertips, she clamped it between her knees. The shard cut her skin. Quickly moving the rope over the glass, nothing happened. She cried, trying to cut the rope that held her near the radiator. But it was in vain. Desperation made Hannah want to howl. The smell. It started to sting her eyes. She didn't know if she was crying from the smell or from despair. The shard fell to the floor. Hannah pulled with all her might. The rope stretched. Another pull. Another. Her hands cramped with pain. She closed her eyes and opened them again. It seemed to be working. The rope in the place where she tried to cut it had thinned, but not enough. Another pull, another. Hannah moaned in pain, pushed her feet against the wall, and pulled with all her strength. Suddenly, she fell sharply on her back. It seemed right onto the shards of the glass. The girl struggled to get up, pushed the door with her shoulder. Luckily, it gave way. The corridor was filled with dark smoke, and Hannah coughed. Trisha, Sophie, Kevin. She screamed. No one answered. First, she rushed to Sophie's room. Running was challenging. She risked losing her balance. But Sophie's room was empty. Hannah struggled down to the first floor. It seemed there was less smoke here. She sprinted to Kevin's room. He was lying in his bed, motionless. At first, she thought he was dead. Kevin, she shouted, wake up. He opened his eyes. His gaze was vacant and senseless. What? He said, what happened? Wake up. Kevin, the house is on fire. Sophie, he sat up but immediately collapsed back onto the pillow. Head, get up. Hannah was already screaming. We need to find Trisha. He got up and followed Hannah unsteadily. Trisha was in her room, sleeping strangely soundly. Trisha recovered faster. Oh God, where's Sophie? I don't know. Hannah sobbed. I don't know anything. We need to leave. Sophie is in the pantry. Kevin suddenly said. She always hides there when she's scared. Go, I'll catch up soon. No, Kevin. Trisha tried to hold him back. Wait, I won't leave without her. He yelled. You go. Neighbors had gathered around. We've called the firefighters. Someone shouted. A man and a woman Hannah didn't know were running towards them. Someone asked about Kevin and Ariana. Hannah looked at the house. Apparently, the fire started on the second floor, where Kevin was now. She couldn't comprehend anything. It was as if her brain was refusing to process information. She even forgot about the pain in her hands. There was only one thought in her mind. Please, let them be alive. Let Kevin find his daughter. It's going to burn down completely. Trisha cried. The roof will collapse any moment. God, help them. Why are you just standing here? But no one dared to enter the house. Hannah wanted to run there herself, with her hands tied. To help, to save and do at least something. She took a few steps towards the house, but strong hands caught her. She tried to break free, but they held her firmly. Quietly, quietly. The firefighters will be here soon, someone told her. The flames intensified. It was already bursting out of the windows on the second floor, black smoke rising to the sky. Hannah heard people's voices, the fire truck siren, and stared at the door, not turning away and not breathing. She saw Kevin. He was coming towards them, still staggering, carrying something wrapped in a blue blanket with stars. Sophie's beloved blanket. They're alive. Trisha gasped. Hannah's legs gave way. 
She collapsed onto the grass. The roof caved in. A column of bright, star-like sparks soared into the air. Hannah realized she was losing consciousness. The pain in her wrist returned, preventing her from fainting. Kevin approached Hannah and sat beside her. She heard Sophie sobbing, wrapped in a blanket. They sat in silence, watching the burning house. And then he embraced her, holding her clothes. And finally, Hannah calmed down. Suddenly, as if someone flipped an invisible switch in her brain, she realized they were alive. They were all alive. The rest didn't matter. Hannah spent the next few days in the hospital. Her hands were severely damaged, and several splinters were removed from her back. The doctor stitched her up but mentioned that she would likely have scars. But Hannah wasn't concerned. What worried her more was what had really happened and who the person was that tied her to the radiator. What happened on that dreadful night, on the third day? Trisha came to see her. She had lost weight, and new wrinkles appeared. Hannah. She hugged Hannah so tightly that she could hardly breathe the my girl. You saved us all, darling. How are Kevin and Sophie? Hannah asked. What happened to them? They're fine. Sophie is unharmed, hid in the pantry, scared of something. She says an unfamiliar person was wandering around the house. But Kevin got burned, his hands and back. But he's okay. Oh, my poor boy. He went through so much. And the worst thing, you know, Trish lowered her voice. It's likely the work of Dr. Shepard. Hannah wasn't surprised, but still asked, What do you mean? The investigation has started. It's too much of a strange coincidence. They took Ariana, and suddenly, this fire, and they found some drug in Kevin's blood. It seems Dr. Shepard was poisoning him all this time, and he I thought he was a godsend let him into the house, fed him. All the details Hannah learned from Gemma, who came to visit her. Her father had numerous connections and had much more information than Trisha. It turned out that Ariana and Dr. Shepard were indeed lovers. They met when Ariana went to a private medical center for a planned plastic surgery. It was unclear how the unremarkable, portly Dr. Shepard charmed Ariana, but she fell in love with him and he reciprocated. Dr. Shepard wanted Ariana to be his wife, but there was one obstacle money. The lovers thought that after the divorce, Ariana would get too little. The option of Kevin's death seemed much more attractive, so she would become a widow and inherit all the rights to his songs, Gemma recounted with a trembling voice. Well, they came up with this plan. Kevin would die and Ariana would be blameless having a solid alibi since she's supposedly sick. Then she gradually wakes up, and there's this doctor who's been trying to save her all along. And, you know, it's all so beautifully scripted, like in a TV series. That's why he didn't want caregivers with medical education, Hannah said. They might have figured it out. Exactly, Gemma nodded. Dr. Shepard listened to Kevin, trusted him, fought a doctor, by definition, should be honest. Wait, did she really sleep for whole days? Hannah wondered. You can't fake that, can you? Well, you can't. Gemma agreed. Have you seen the movie Saw? What's that got to do with anything? Asked Hannah. Are you suggesting we watch it now? Gemma frowned. You're silly. In that movie, an octa plays a corpse. I don't know how to part it, but, well, throughout the entire film, he lies motionless in the center of the room. Can you imagine how long a shooting day lasts? And you have to lie absolutely still. And he managed. Hannah asked. So, it's actually possible. Gemma smirked. Impossible. A person can't lie still for that long. So, they administered special drugs that relax the muscles. They found them in Oriana's blood. Also, some sleeping pills. Almost a year. Hannah exclaimed. Living like that must drive you insane. Well, probably. She did some stretching at night. Gemma shrugged. Plus, the dosages, as I was told, were small. Maybe she did some stretching. Hannah agreed. I saw an earring in her ear once. Perhaps. She entertained herself that way sometimes. 
What a story. And the notebook with dosages. It turns out she started taking that medicine even before she went to bed. To play the sick role. Did you find the notebook? Gemma beamed. Where is it? Dad could use it. Dr. Shepard took it from me. Hannah sighed. But there's something else. A letter. Cool. Gemma exclaimed. You're like a detective. Will you give it to us? I hope. I'll pass it on to my dad. Wait. Who tied me up? Hannah suddenly asked. Did Dr. Shepard hire someone? Yes. Gemma nodded. Dad says most likely. Maybe Kevin didn't want to die. And the medication was affecting Ariana's health. Perhaps they were afraid you'd find out. Ariana saw you noticing the earring. And then there's this notebook. They likely hastened the process of eliminating you, wanting to simulate a fire. Ariana already let slip that they were supposed to take Sophie out of the house, but couldn't find her. The hit man, it seems, just left everything as it was. Can you imagine the audacity? They almost burned a child. Yes, it's a relief that it all turned out okay. Hannah sighed. She looked at her bandaged hands. Scars would remain. But it didn't matter. She never regretted what she did for a moment. And how's Kevin? Hannah asked quietly. Do you know? Dad says he's okay until they release him from the hospital. Just got a bit of smoke inhalation. Gemma winked. He wants to see you. Says you saved his life. Kevin came to Hannah three days later. The doctors didn't want to let him go. But he almost escaped from them to see Hannah. He silently sat on her bed. Despite all he had been through, Kevin looked even better than before. Probably because they no longer administered the toxic drug to him. They looked at each other and said nothing. Hannah admired his face, and for some reason, an overwhelming desire to cry overcame her. Remember that melody I played lately? He suddenly asked, you know, before the fire. The girl nodded, yes, it was beautiful. I don't know how to say this. He gently took her hand. It seemed so silly, but it was about you. I hated myself. Ariana is sick, and like an idiot, I'm admiring you all day. Hannah swallowed. It just couldn't be true. I just want to tell you something, Hannah. I owe you, for life. If it weren't for you, all of us, and Sophie too, it's terrifying to think about. They fell silent again. He squeezed her hand. Hannah, I don't want to part with you. Not because I owe you everything now. I just don't want to. And Sophie neither. She asks about you, misses you. Hannah, it will probably be difficult after all this. And I have no right to ask you to share these difficulties with us. But that's what difficulties are for. To share them with someone. The girl answered quietly. And I'll never leave you. How would you manage without me? You, Sophie. Trisha, he smiled. I knew you'd say that. Six months passed. Dr. Shepard was sentenced to prison. Hannah didn't seek details. She simply didn't want to. But she knew he received a substantial term. The trial for Ariana was still ongoing. She claimed ignorance about her lover's plans. But the letter found by Hannah spoke volumes. Kevin bought a new house in a different location. Kevin regained his strength. He no longer looked as emaciated and even resumed sports activities. Sophie longed for her mother and couldn't comprehend what had happened. However, Kevin found a good psychologist and the girl's condition gradually normalized. Hannah hoped that eventually she could overcome this trauma, though she understood she wouldn't forget her mother's betrayal. She wouldn't forget but perhaps she could find it in herself to forgive. Much like she forgave her own mom, Hannah. Then Kevin proposed to Hannah, and she accepted. The song he dedicated to his bride played at their wedding. The same one he played at nights. The one Hannah listened to, holding her breath. Only now, this melody finally soared high. Sounding not mournful, but filled with hope for future happiness.